There you go. You hear that? Recording yep. in progress. Okay, perfect. Got hey, well, welcome to the show, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing today, man? Oh, I'm doing good. It's uh, it's Christmas Eve, so I got my little um, uh, winter Christmas oh. uh, thing going on. You know. You don't have an ugly uh, what is it like ugly sweater? Ug ugly is Christmas it, sweater? Yeah, is that a thing in Canada? Uh, I think it's a thing everywhere, man. <laughs> <laughs> in, in north in north america i think it's 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 a thing it's, like it's, yeah 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 this like I, I used to think this is ugly but it's growing on me it's been a couple of years that i have it so i'm i'm happy with it i mean it's not particularly ugly i i, I I've, I've seen worse <laughs> <laughs> there, there's always worse there's always oh, yeah worse, you know? i know I, at first i felt a little bit weird like because you know it's ah, whatever but then you know, uh, it, it grew on me over, over the years. So now I'm like, and it's actually, the material is actually quite nice. I bought this in Japan. So, mm. um, this was like last time. No, cause I went to Japan three times and, oh, and, nice. and, and yeah, I think the first time is when the first time I went to Japan is where I bought this. Cause my, my wife is Japanese. That's why. Oh, oh, okay. So you, I thought it was in my mind, I, I, I immediately thought about like, okay, this is a pilgrimage. So you're going to train in Japan, but then you mentioned that your family is, you know, your wife from Japan. So it's probably not just for training, <laughs> but I, I did manage to get some training in while I was there the first, uh, the first two times I went. Uh, but when I went there, uh, the first two times I, I didn't, I didn't practice judo. I was just doing jujitsu, Brazilian mm. jujitsu. And, um, yeah, so, you know, I, like I passed by the Kodokan, but I didn't train there. I just kind of passed by and took pictures and, and, you know, did the whole tourist thing. Mm. Yeah, and that was nice. Hey, but let me introduce you to my uh, to the audience. Okay, so Andrea uh, Moll, right? No. Mole, it's fine. Mole, no mole. Yes. Okay, okay, mole. I wasn't sure if it was mole or like mo or mole, mole, you know? It's a French origin name, so it's a, okay. whatever okay. you want to pronounce. I'm, I'm not going to call microaggression on you, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is what happened, uh, guys. Like we, we met up on LinkedIn and then uh, we got to talking. And we just hit it off like really well. Our conversation flowed so easily. And then with all the things that we were talking about, I was like, hey, we got to gotta get on a podcast and do this, you know, because it's just, it's just wasted content. So then I asked you to, uh, if, you wanted to if you were interested in, you know, getting on like my podcast. Uh, it's not really a podcast because it's only on YouTube that I post it, you know. But, and you said yes. So I'm, I'm really happy you said yes. And, uh, you know, I didn't even prepare for this podcast like you even told me hey if you have any um you know talking points or, or questions and all that send it to me beforehand if you want and uh i didn't do it because the truth is i went snowboarding and i was really tired <laughs> <laughs> but also I, I was very confident that uh our conversation is going to flow very easily and uh once we get into it it's going to go like like i said like all over the place so so andrea for all of you guys who um uh are listening uh is a um well a martial arts right and mm -hmm. you like to describe yourself as a martial arts nerd and you also teach uh aikido uh aki jiu-jitsu and karate and you did some judo yeah um i'm all over the place that way so uh i started with judo i was seven or something like that with my cousin my cousin was pretty good at judo back in italy i'm, I'm originally from italy so oh, okay. you know uh, uh forgive me for my accent sometimes um, so I started off there when I was, I think it was 16 years old. Uh, my cousin wanted to, to experiment with Aikido, wanted to try Aikido. So I went with him and I kind of got hooked into that. Uh, and then I know there's going to be a lot of people in the comment section, but oh, well, Aikido, this or that, that's fine. I don't care. But uh, so I, I, I kept practicing it ever since. I'm 46. So we're, we're talking about 30 years of practice slash teaching. And along the way, I pick up other things. Uh, again, I'm a nerd. So I just wanted to explore different things. I was like, okay, striking. Oh, yeah, we don't really have striking at Aikido. And there was a, you know, a karate instructor in the same place, in the same dojo. So I started working a little bit out with him. And then, you know, one thing from another. Then when I, you know, went to Japan, I lived in Japan for a few years. And I, you know, I tried some Shurinji Kenpo. I tried some Kenjutsu. I tried some, you know, a lot of other things. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't consider myself an Aikidoka. I, uh, I like to think about myself as a martial artist. And uh, of course, you know, there's things that I know more and there are things that I'm still trying to figure out. But as long as my body holds, I'll, I'll practice. 
you know, yeah, and all those yeah. other things. Well, that's the thing too. I, I consider myself like a martial artist first. And after that, we get into like what I actually train, what's my specialty, what I've trained longer and what I, you know, my preferences and, and this and that, because, um, you know, like, like, like labeling yourself and limiting yourself to just one style, it, it kind of doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, you know, because no, it, it's, it's crazy. I mean, man, there's people that label themselves not only within the, you know, the whole spectrum, but they label themselves within the arts. And say, okay, no, what what style are you practicing? And you know, what what is your who is your sensei? What is your lineage? And and all these things, like man, I mean, like you you cornering yourself too narrow, and you're you're missing out on a lot of things. And yeah, yeah, you're closing, you're like you're you're um you're closing off your mind, you know. So now you're like, oh, I'm a uh you know I'm a I'm a keto guy, and this is my lineage, and this is the the style I practice, and this is you know my philosophy. But the thing is, uh, the way I, because back in the day, they used to promote um, how I think a lot of schools would say something like, this is the style we're practicing. This is all you need and you're good. You don't need to explore anything else. You know, you just got to keep working on uh, developing this particular style and, and, and it's unbeatable. Like it smashes everything. I think, uh, you know, Rokas from uh, Martial Arts Journey. Yeah, yeah, of course. He, he talked about that. He talked about it in one of his YouTube videos where, uh, you know, when he was asking his sensei questions uh, regarding like, hey, how come, you know, uh, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? This doesn't seem to work. And should I explore other martial arts or whatever? And, and his sensei said something to that effect uh, that, uh, no, 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 just Aikido works for everything, everything. So just keep doing Aikido. And then he, he listened and... <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, you know, Rokis, right? Yeah, no, I, I know, I know. I, and, uh, I, I'm a fan in a way because uh, I think, I think is is going through is going through a little, a very interesting process that he is sharing with everybody. You know, I might not agree with everything that he said, but I, but I agree with the goal that he has in mind. And, and yeah, of course, but he, you know, I just want to make sure that we understand what we're talking about here for you know for the, the viewers. So, so one thing is preserving something. And and I think to that extent, if you're interested in preserving a school, um, you should you should devote yourself into study every minutia because you your your job is to transmit that. Like it, you're you're studying a dead language, okay. A dead language is not is nothing you're gonna be using at a grocery store, but it has its purpose. And so you want to make sure that you're preserving that, that you're not contaminating that with other things. The other thing is what, what your martial arts is going to look, what your practice is going to look, what your reach is going to look. And at that point, as an individual practitioner or even as a school, you should evolve. You should, you should bring something new. You should be open to be questioned. You should also because to understand what you're doing, pretty much. Um, so I, I think the mistake... In, in many Aikido schools is to consider Aikido as, as, a, as a closed system, as, as a box. It wasn't like that to begin with, by the way, because it's a Gendai Buddha, is a modern Buddha, so it's not something that dates back hundreds of years or thousands of years that you, you want to preserve the way it is without contaminating. Uh, but I, you know, I understand why people would say, this is the way we do things here in this dojo. Okay, what I don't understand is just to tell your students that this is the only thing that you need, this is the only way it works, this is, this is, this is, this is, that doesn't make sense. So when, when I teach my students, say, well, we're doing this, why we're doing this? Uh, well, because this is the way started the system. This is the way we train. Uh, let's do this. And then we're going to explore other things. We're going to explore applications. We're going to explore, explore you know, similarities between what we're doing and what they're doing in other school, what they're doing, what we're doing, what we're doing in judo, uh, what we're doing in other uh, martial arts. So, mm -hmm. uh, but you I, know what, I, I, I think, I think I might have an idea of why, um, like some, some instructors or some senseis uh, go about that that way. They say, no, 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 you don't need to learn anything else. Just, you know, learn this. It's because they, they have a fear of losing their students. You know, like, let's say a student comes in because he thinks that uh, Aikido is what he's going to need to be able to defend himself against, you know, uh, because he's being bullied or whatever. And then after that, if, um, <clears throat> if the student starts looking elsewhere, he might discover that those things, other martial arts are maybe a little bit more, um, uh, 
uh, are maybe a little bit better for, uh, you know, street fighting or self-defense. Mm. You know, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I think that maybe they have that fear possibly. Yeah. And, no, and sure, that's why they sure. tell their students that like, uh, like it's not, or maybe they really do believe that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, there, there's quite a few people that actually believe that, and they believe because they were told that way, and they practice that way the whole, the, their whole life. Uh, there's a lot of Kool-Aid drinking in martial arts, and that's, that's true for, I would say, every school from old, you know, lineages to modern martial arts to MMA too, there's a lot of drink, you know, Kool-Aid uh, drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I'd say it's more of an, you know, how much Kool-Aid you drink and the flavor. But uh, so one thing is what you actually said. The other is, yes, of course, you're losing students, especially if you're losing revenue, especially mm -hmm. if you're, you know, basing your income or part of your income on having students. And, you know, one strategy to retain them might be to tell them there's nothing out there to, you know, that is worth looking at. But to be honest with you, I don't think that's as a marketing strategy is, is holding water anymore. This is not in the 1990s. This is not in the 1980s, okay? Students go online and, and have commentaries and, and they hear things and they talk to other people and they talk to other people that practice other martial arts and it, they discover things. They have questions. If you don't address those questions, they're going to find their answers somewhere else. So to me, the best thing is to be very, you know, very forward of what Aikido does. We're talking about Aikido. We're talking about every martial arts, what it does good, what it doesn't do, do good and let the student cho choose for themselves. So sometimes I wonder, we're talking about Rokas, for example. Sometimes I wonder if Rokas went into an Aikido school that wasn't that sectarian or cultish, <laughs> maybe his pad would have been much different. Maybe he dropped Aikido after a week or two, maybe. Maybe he had continued, you know, having his, 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 you know, experience with other martial arts much sooner. And so he maybe wouldn't feel betrayed like he was, like he felt. And, you know, I agree with him. You know, if I had gone through the same process that he'd gone through with the same organizations and the same people, I would feel the same way. I, I was lucky enough not to be told that Aikido was this magnificent uh, super martial arts like yeah like day. a superpower you know like yeah, once you master no. it you know anybody comes at you you just twirl them around and throw them in the air you know and <laughs> no 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 absolutely so my, my first aikido sensei uh and my most important aikido teacher you know of, of everybody every uh everyone else that i that i you know met uh, afterwards was first was, was was a doctor a medical doctor his doctor a medical doctor he had a background in judo uh, he was very biomechanically oriented. So it was very like, okay, this is what we do. This is what we were trying to achieve. This is how the body works and, and such and so. And there were, there were no discussion at all about the chi or chi or, or magical powers or, or all these other things that are pretty common in many Aikido classes or Aikido schools. And I ain't talking about Aikido, but we're talking about Tai Chi, we can talk about Kung Fu, we can talk about Wushu, we can talk about other martial arts, Japanese or not, okay? So this is my experience. And, and, and so it was interesting because the, you know, every time I went off with, you know, in other schools, especially at the beginning, and I heard all these conversation about the, the key and the energy and the absorption and whatever, it was like, oh, okay, what, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> This is uh, no, that, no, that's not, that's not possible. So, but, but uh, I was lucky that way. Okay. Okay. That's a very interesting, um, uh, a mix right there, like judo and Aikido, because I think that if you have a background in judo, like I never done Aikido. Uh, I think most mm -hmm. of my audience, uh, knows that. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've made the mistake in the past of criticizing martial arts that I, that I never practiced a little bit too harshly. And, why, why? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, I don't think it's a mistake. I think, mm -hmm. uh. well, no, I think that back then I had, um, uh, I wasn't as open-minded to, to mm -hmm. traditional martial arts, even though that's what I started with. But then after that, when I got into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and then I got into, uh, that I discovered MMA 
And then I was like, oh, this is, this is, this is what really works. And all the other stuff was essentially nonsense. So it was kind of like a knee jerk reaction, same way as, uh, 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 like Rokas, right? When he, yeah. when he discovered all that and he was like, kind of, he felt betrayed. He felt like he wasted his time and, you know, so a little bit of that going on. So then I was like, from one, from starting off in traditional martial arts, all of a sudden when I discovered, you know, like, uh, like the Brazilian, uh, Jiu Jitsu mm-hmm. and, and all those, you know, essentially MMA, um, uh, the martial arts that are in MMA, that's when I kind of did like a 180 and I just like, rebelled against all the other traditional martial arts and i think some people go through that uh, a lot of people go through that not just uh Rukis, but myself included and then so my opinion was very um <clears throat> judgmental and very angry towards uh traditional martial arts right but mm-hmm. then not, but with time i've uh i've come to realize that uh you have to keep an open mind and also i had this one friend that did um did a lot of traditional martial arts and then he was, uh, we started sparring together because he was teaching me how to, um, to box, how to kickbox and everything. And yeah, he was beating me up pretty bad. <laughs> and then I came to realize, and then, then the way he explained it to me, he really broke it down into, okay, well, this is why we do it like this. This is the style. This is the idea behind it. And it was very, no, no crazy chi power prana stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but he was just breaking it down a very mechanically and more scientifically on like, okay, why you would want to condition your, your hands. Like what's the purpose behind it. And this is where it came from and so on and so on. This is how, this is how it could actually be used. And then he used it in sparring. And that's when I realized, well, actually some of this stuff does work. It, it really depends on the practitioner. And of course uh, depends on like context also. So wait, where was I going with this? Um, I tend to do that, go off tangents a little no, bit. No worries. I, I think we were talking about the, the space of traditional martial arts and, oh. and that, that, that kind of a reaction that some people that like you or Rokas or, or other, you know, the most mm-hmm. part oh. had transitioning from one world to another, like considering that uh, and allow me sometimes I get into maybe technical mm-hmm. lingo because that's, you know, I'm a professor at university. And then so sometimes we get, we get caught into the way we speak. But I think most people, you know, you probably saw that as a zero sum game at that point. It's like, it's either traditional martial arts have a value and MMA or functional martial arts don't, or it's the other way around. So it, it has to be mutually exclusive, which, which I don't think is a healthy way to approach. I understand why people get through that mm-hmm. when they get from the traditional to the functional or to the modern. Uh, but, but it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, I think there's a space for, you know, as long as we understand what is the space of one and what is the space of the other, uh, I don't think they're, 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 they can be considered as substitute goods. And I think like, you don't have to take either the blue pill or the red pill. <laughs> you and can I, take I, both. You could, yeah, exactly. You could take one after the other or both at the same time. And I realized that now, and now my mind is like a lot more open to this kind of, um, to these traditional martial arts, because these people weren't fools, like they were human beings and somebody like, you know, developed this because there's a lot of things in there that do work. Now, how it was passed on and what it has become, I mean, you know, things got mutated and maybe things got lost in translation and, and the, you know, it's out of context. So, so maybe that's, that's, that's one of the reasons why it had some martial arts now have like a, a Traditional martial arts have a bad rep uh, among the functional martial arts uh, community, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I remember how I got to this. So I was talking about your, your first professor who was a doctor and who, who did judo and Aikido mm-hmm. at the same time. And then after that, I, was, uh, I just went off and I said, okay, just a disclaimer to everybody listening, but most, most of the audience already knows I don't do Aikido. And I used to judge martial arts that I, I even though I didn't, didn't actually practice them. So that was, um, so, so now I'm kind of like, I take both pills, you know, I take the red pill and I take the blue pill and it's all, it's all good, you know, and there's, there's a lot to learn from both of them. And, but going back to what I was uh, saying regarding uh, judo and Aikido, how it's a very interesting mix because, well, if you learn judo and you studied it to, to um, let's say at least black belt and, and, you know, you got your black belt, you understand like um, the martial art itself, all the techniques to go. Then after that, you go into and, and you practice Aikido. I mean, I think that you would actually be able to, your understanding is, is even deeper and you could make Aikido work mm-hmm. and you, you would know when not to use it and when you would be able to use it and so on. So 
it's it's really it, it seems I think it's it's really cool that you actually got to learn from somebody who did both. And on top of that, who's a doctor, so he's very biomechanical. He's not, you know, like just telling you all kinds of uh, um, uh, craziness, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think that 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 is what saved me. And that is probably what, what got me into that in the first place, because I didn't want to, um, not that I don't like, so uh, I do like the idea of magical power. Don't get me wrong. I think everybody likes that. As the, our inner kid likes the idea of, well, you know, the, the possibility. The whole, whole Hollywood, like the Marvel Cinematic Universe is based on right. that, right? It's, exactly. It's, you, want to, that, you want that, you know, true. and. You know, we will grow up in the 80s, right? 80s and 90s. So yeah, yeah, we're the, all, uh, the TV was, was full of that. And, you know, it, it's it's fine, you know, to wonder and dream to become a Ninja Turtles. And then at some point you would realize that you, there's, that you can become a turtle and you can become a ninja. Uh, and so what I would... What I'm going with this is that I do love that idea, but I also like the idea of having something that can be learned by pretty much everybody. I, I think it's more it's more fascinating when we move from the screen to reality or real life. I think for me, it's much more uh, interesting and rewarding the idea that there's there's system out there. It would be BJJ, MMA, Judo, Aikido, Karate, and everything that could be taught to people. And, you know, people might be better or worse or whatever, that, you know, that we have all, all have so, all sort of physical limitation, but it's something that can be learned as opposed that, oh, you have to be the chosen one to be able <laughs> to use that. And, and everybody, you know, dream of being the chosen one, but you, come on, it's, it's, it's not something that actually happened. So, I mean, yeah, part of me say like, well, if I could throw people just by looking at them with, with the power of my ki or chi or prana, that would be really cool. What is the probability that happened? It's probably zero. Okay, so let's concentrate on something that can actually be learned. Yeah, yeah. And, and to be honest, like um, beyond like, um, like fantasy magic and, uh, you know, fireballs and, and, and you know, like all deaf touches and stuff like that, I realized that uh, through my practice of martial arts that, that when you get to a high level in, in any martial arts, I mean, it is, it does feel magical in the way they do things. Mm -hmm. When you look at how people move at a high level, uh, you know, in, yeah. in judo competitions, in MMA, in striking, in anything, uh, you know, sometimes you don't, you don't, when you, when you watch it on screen, it's one thing, but when you experience it, like a person in front of you who's a very high level striker mm -hmm. and you can, you absolutely are helpless in front of him, even though you're, you're doing your best, you're trying to punch him, you're trying to kick him. And he's just like, you know, essentially moving very little, like a millimeter here, a millimeter there, you know, and in his footwork. And then you just can't, you can't find him, you know, you can't find him and none of your punches are landing and he can touch you whenever he wants. Uh, somebody who, who's not smashing you to oblivion just because, he feels no. like, it, but who could like, you know, just go with you, go light and then adjust his level accordingly. But that's when you see like, wow, there's actually levels to the game and it's deep. It's very deep. And even in judo, um, when I practice with, uh, you know, like I practice with people, uh, same belt as me, um, I'm a brown belt in judo. So when I practice people are brown belts and then there's black belts, but then there's different levels of black belts. And then there's guys who've, uh, you know, competed at a high level when you you fight against guys who competed a lot when you fight guys who are on the national team when you fight like uh ex-olympians it's a it's a completely different game and and to me those little things that they're able to do is magical like it mm -hmm. feels like magic because you, you're, you're just whole helpless in front of them you know so like it, it goes the, the the level of um the skill level in some of these martial artists is, is incredible it's like, you don't understand until you actually fight them, you know, and ne not necessarily a real fight, but I'm just saying you train with them and you spar with them. That's when you realize, wow, this person can really um, do whatever they want and you would be helpless. Yeah. Even, and they might be the exact same size as you. They might even be smaller than you. And, and then you realize, wow, like, um, yeah. So, so that's what, uh, to me, it's, 
like, uh, I don't even need to go into that realm of, you know, fireballs and like, you know, like, uh, you know, and flying and, and all those uh, crazy stuff that, that we, we grew up watching and, and wish that it was true. To me, just, just the way things are now and the levels that people have been able to attain is, is magical enough, you know? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I, I would agree with you. I mean, if you look at professional boxer, the good ones, you know, you, you see them fighting or just even sparring and even shadow boxing sometimes mm -hmm. just by seeing what they're doing it's like oh wow that's that's really magical and you know when you had a chance to practice with some of those people whether it's a boxer or judo player or bjj guy or karate guy or everything you know even aikido persons uh you know you you realize that you know they have you know, such control of their body and the situation and the context that, you know, it really looks like magic. Uh, but it's a level of magic that is at least theoretically attainable. And that, yeah. That's what fascinates me. That's what, that, that is what God hooked, hooked me into martial arts for maybe 40 years at this point, if I count my first years mm -hmm. uh, when I was a kid. So I think that's, that's what amazes me every day. When you meet these people and you realize they can do certain things and you want to learn how and you want to push yourself more and more and more and more and more. Maybe you never get there. I mean, I can do you boxing know, as much as I want, but I will never get to that level. It's not that you'll never get at, at, to that level. It's just that it would require you to invest as much time. You know? Yeah. And of course there's there's genetic component to, to it to it too. You know, like you might not uh um, like be, for example, being explosive mm -hmm. is high, it's, it's a genetic thing. You could train to be more explosive, but only to your, up to your genetic limit. People don't understand that. People think that, oh, if I train a certain way, if I train, there's protocol trading protocols that will allow you to be more explosive. Not true. Not true. You're born with what you, you born, you, you got what you got. You're born with it. That's it. So what that means is that, um, some people, okay. Can contract their muscles. Um, you recruit their muscle fibers, uh, let's say 50% of them, 50% of their muscle fibers, they could recruit in like one, one go. Right. And then other people can recruit 70 other people can recruit 80. So the amount of muscle fibers that you're able to recruit, right. Is genetic hmm. <laughs> is determined by genetics. So you're That's explosive. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm studying this and I'm learning this because I'm always evolving. I'm not I'm not the type of trainer uh, or coach who, who uh, just, you know, read a couple of books, did a couple of certificates and that's it. And then, you know, and pe people fall into that because then they're busy working and they never uh, look for more. Right. But I always want to understand more and, and find, um, find the truth, so to speak, mm. so that I could use it on myself mainly. <laughs> Look, I didn't know that. That's that's something that I learned today because I, I didn't really know that there was. I, I'm, I'm of, of course I'm aware there are genetic and biomechanical and biological differences. Advantages we have, and a lot exactly. of people now. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people now kind of argue that arguing that everything is socially constructed. It's 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 not. It can be acquired. Of course, it's not. Uh, but I didn't know specifically that the explosiveness was 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 so determined by. But you're genetic, as you said. That's that's fascinating. I wonder if there is any way to understand what what's your genetic allows you to do. What what is that? What is that your limit? Mm, you know, um, I remember there being some tests. It has to do with your mus uh, fast your your muscle fibers, right? Mm -hmm. Because you got essentially uh, three types of muscle fibers. Let's say you got slow twitch, medium twitch, and fast twitch. How much proportional fast twitch okay. versus medium, and you know, so that's going to uh, determine how explosive you could actually be. Hmm. That's it. That's pretty much it. And then after that, how hard you, and, and of course, if you have more fast twitch muscle fibers, it means you could contract a lot harder. Uh, you could recruit more, more muscle fibers when you contract. So because you could recruit more, you could accelerate faster. So you could, you're more explosive. That's hmm. it. So now if you're a skinny dude and you're made to be explosive, then if you get bigger and stronger, you'll be even more explosive. Uh, you know, you're, it's not because the, it's not because you, you did any kind of special training to become more explosive. No, it's because you got your big, your muscles bigger and stronger. So that's, that's, and you're already like predisposed to be explosive. Right. And right. That's what it is. But if you, if you, if you don't have those 
uh, everybody has a mix of those, right? Slow twitch, fast twitch, uh, slow, medium, fast. Uh, some of the, some people have more medium or more slow or whatever. So those people, they're not going to, they, they could do whatever they want under the sun, any kind of protocol that they see on the internet, people promising them that, oh, you could like attach a rubber band to your hand and punch and you're going to be more explosive. No, you're not like, <laughs> no, you're not. It's, it's just gonna, it's actually probably good. It's, it's always, and from my understanding at this point, and from my own experience, it's a step in the wrong direction to, to try to mimic uh, sports movements or martial art movements by and using resistance against it. Right. If you lift weights, you lift weights. You get big and strong, and then you go practice your, your skill. You know, so mm -hmm. you separate the two, and it's a better way of doing it. You'll get less injuries and all. Mm -hmm. uh, but all that to say that for the guy who has, who's not explosive by nature, and you know if you're explosive or not, like it, it shows at a very early, like, uh, I wouldn't say a very early age, but you could tell like, um, you know, like if somebody's explosive and they know if they're explosive, you know, because it's always the kid who jumps higher than everybody else who runs faster than everyone else. Like, you know, in high school, right? Like you right, know, right, just right. kids who are like, they already have abs and they don't do nothing. And they're, you know, they're like 10 years old, hmm. you know? So, so, but if I, you're I, not one of those guys and you're, you're, you're like, you know, you could be like, like, um, uh, you can, you can max out your genetics. Let's say, for example, you're, uh, you're, you're a kid, you're a skinny kid, and you're not that, uh, you know, you're, you're not that explosive. Now, if you get bigger and stronger, you're going to become more explosive, but only to your genetic limit, to what you're predisposed to be. But you hmm. can never compare yourself to the, the kid who, uh, who just has it. You know, he could just, he just, he just burns everybody like in a, in, in, in a hundred meter dash, you know, mm. who could like jump. Uh, I don't know how many feet up, like you do box jumps like all day long and he could touch, you know? So mm -hmm. you're not, you're not going to catch, you're not going to be that guy. So to get back to what, we're, what I was saying that like, you could actually be at a very high level in martial arts. Let's say two people being genetically equal. One of them is a professional at a very high level. And then the other one isn't and uh, because he just didn't, you know, you have to look at the rate of progression. Like if one guy has been training for 20 years and you've been training for, uh, you know, five, well, obviously you got 15 years, he, ha he has 15 yeah. years on him. But if you had the same amount of time, right, everything else being equal, you would be just as good as him. Hmm. If, if everything being equal, genetics is the same, right? You right. both have great genetics. Uh, and then um, he spent 20 years uh, you know, boxing, you spent 20 years teaching, you know, and, and doing other stuff with your life. It's not that you can't be like him. It's just that you would have to invest the same amount of time. Right, right, right. So it's, it's, yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. And it's really interesting. So understanding what's your, what's your potential is and getting, you know, whatever path to get to that potential, but there's a certain amount of investment that you have to make. It's like you're, you're banking for your retirement. One thing, if you start banking, you know, a little, you know, amount of money or whatever money when you're 18 and you progress. And one thing, if you start when you're 40, if you start at your 40, you want to have the same output. You say, you know, let's say the same pot, you got to put more money into that. That's, mm -hmm. that's no other way around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, like, um, and, and the problem sometimes when we start older is that, you know, we, we already accumulate a lot of injuries. We're, we're busy. Mm -hmm. We don't have much, as much time. We have a lot of responsibilities, you know, towards work, towards family, towards, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And, uh, you know, we just can't dedicate that amount of time, but it doesn't mean that you're, you wouldn't be able to be as good as that person if you, uh, invested that same amount of time. And I used to look up at, um, I remember when I started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or even when mm -hmm. I was younger, like. Yeah, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and I would see guys who are like, um, or uh, really good, even in judo or any sport. You know, I would see them like, wow, these guys are really good. I would be really impressed by them, and I would like, I, I would kind of put them on a pedestal in my mind. You know, and now, uh, you know, like, oh, this guy's like really high level, and you know, he deserves respect and all that. And um, now, like, uh, I come to realize that, you know what? If I were if I like, um, cause I understand my genetics now and, and, and I believe mm -hmm. that if I, if circumstances would have been different as a youth, when I was a kid and, um, um, I got a little bit more support, uh, from my parents, you know, I could have easily been in the Olympics in a martial art, in a combat sport in martial mm -hmm. arts, easily in the Olympics. And I believe I could have been podium 
And that's why now I don't put anybody on a pedestal anymore. Like when I, when I meet somebody who's super high level, I respect, I absolutely respect everybody, whether they're, they've achieved something so-called achieve something great, or they didn't, it doesn't matter to me. Person's a person, you know, I just see them for, for, as a person, as a human being right now, when I see somebody super high level now, I respect what they did, <laughs> but I also realized that if I had the chance, I would have done that too. Mm -hmm. you know, but I didn't have the chance, you know, uh, and, and, and that's, that's just the way it goes. So my current skill level, even though I get beat by, by a guy who's like, uh, who's ex national team member, he's been doing this for 15 years. Yeah. But I've been doing it for, you know, uh, for six. So obviously I can't compete with you and you're younger right. too. And so, you know, but I know that I could be very, comp I would, I would be, I would have been able to compete with you if you gave me the same amount of time definitely I would have been able to compete and maybe beat your ass too. So in my mind, that's where I see it now. It's like no, nothing, none of these guys, not that I don't respect them, but it doesn't impress me to that extent anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I, I'm impressed with the drive and, and, and the drive to win the dedication, the commitment, the sacrifices they did and all that, you know, but I'm not, I'm not impressed by the, the, uh, the so-called result because I know I, that could have been me. That easily mm -hmm. could have been me. Like you tweaked a couple of things that like uh, growing up I, I, and I was put into the right circumstances, I would have been like uh, an Olympian, you know, easily, easily. And that's what I wanted, you know, and that's why now I'm training, I'm competing because I'm just essentially living out my childhood uh, fantasies, you know, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously Olympics is out of the question, but well, being the best that I could be like with where I started, where I started at 36 in judo, th that's what I'm going to do. And, and then that's okay with me. You know, and that is that is great. That is great. How that how is that working out with the martial art community? Because in, in my experience, at least, you know, both a as a member and as a scholar, of that there's a lot of there's a lot of cult of personalities in 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 our neck of the woods. Meaning that a lot of people think about these these you know whether it is Kano or uh, or Weshiba or Funakoshi or one of the Gracies, you pick which one, uh, as almost sacred beings. Ah, it's just craziness. That's I, I, I know, I know it's craziness for my part, but you see that, right? You, you see that happening. Yeah, yeah. It's particularly strong in traditional martial arts. And I would, I would uh, uh, at, at least the ones that don't compete of course, mm -hmm. but I feel it's strong also in, in, in functional martial arts. I feel that is, it's part of the lore maybe, but um, I feel that we tend to have, you know, martial arts tend to be cultish and they tend to, to hold on sacred figures and sacred beings. So I wonder, I wonder what you think about that. I, you know, according to your experience, I, you know, you, 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 you've ditched that. <laughs> long time ago i probably never had it but or maybe i had it but it's it wasn't really was never really particularly strong in in, in me uh what, what what do you feel it and how do you feel it in in the community hmm. what you mean like in um like i understand what you uh i understand what you're saying but like, give, give me an example of like, let's say in BJJ, like, uh, are you talking about maybe Hicks and Gracie? I, I, you know, Hicks and Gracie's or, or any one of the Gracie's that, and again, it's not a criticism to them as athletes or, mm -hmm. or, or teacher. Okay. I'm talking about fantastic people with a fantastic career with great technique. I mm -hmm. uh, just want to put out because I don't want to, you know, I don't want anybody to say, well, you're talking because of this and that. No, and I'm not talking, you know, bad about that. I'm saying oh, really? that they, they created a sort of like a followers in, in which there's a lot of people, they believe everything they say just because it's them saying it. And, you know, in, in BJJ, I, you know, I've, I've learned, I've, I've, I've learned of BJJ in 2006 when I was living in Nagoya. Nagoya has a very big Brazilian community. At least they had it at the time because they were working for Toyota and Lexus. There was a big immigration from Brazil. And, and so there were a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu places and I met people in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu community uh, and I discovered Brazilian jiu-jitsu back then. Um, I was a little, a little late in the game, okay, about that. But, uh, and I, you know, one thing that, that struck me immediately was this, this almost 
religious worshiping of the Gracies that they had. And everything Gracie would say, it was like, like the Bible, okay? Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu invented, you know, uh, Keza Gatame. It's like, no, <laughs> they didn't. It was from Kosen Judo. But they would believe that because the Gracie told you so. And, they, and they, they would eat, you know, they would follow certain eating protocols because the Gracies were doing those things in their compound. The, gra the Gracie diet, yeah, yeah. The Gracie <laughs> diet. And, and so they would do all sorts of things uh, because these people told them. Uh, they didn't tell them to do that, but because of what they wear, they were trying to mimic their lifestyle as much as possible. And they mm -hmm. would not consider anything coming out of, you know, that box as as legitimate and uh and i have seen that happening also one of the criticism that i had with rokas and i and i told him about that one time we had a conversation many years ago but you know, i did with the beginning say well it feels to me that you're moving from a cult to another cult because exactly, the way you're exactly. approaching the way uh -huh. you're approaching bjj now is the same you were approaching uh aikido so you're looking at these professors and whatever they say to you and I think it was something about fixing some Aikido technique. Whatever they say to you, you're going to believe it. Uh, mm -hmm. And they say, well, I believe it because it proves right because of the competition. That's, that's, that's your justification. That's not why you believe it. Mm -hmm. You believe it because now you invested in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Because you uh, want to believe it. And I think, I think yes. as human beings, we want to draw conclusions and we want to have the answer, you know? Yes. And sometimes there is... You know, and, and we can't, we, we want somebody to believe in because it brings a sense of security. It brings a sense of comfort, you know, knowing that you're doing the right thing. And then, of course, if you invest, a, if you're investing a lot of time in something, then you want, um, you know, you want, you want to be right in your, yeah. in your decision and your conclusion. So, so you, you kind of find everything uh, possible to, to agree with, you know, and, and you, you, you don't want to hear anything else, you know, no. kind of thing. And um, yeah. so I think that that's, it's, I think it's just human nature, you know, to a certain extent, it's, it's comfort, you know, like, like, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it's just like, oh, no, this is, this is it. I don't have to look where, anywhere else. It's, and, and maybe, maybe a lack of, of um, uh, maybe a little bit of laziness. I don't know, like, you know, like not wanting to explore, not wanting it to be, because it's hard, right? Like in the sense that you, like the way I look at it is that nobody's invincible. Mm -hmm. nobody as a human beings we're not invincible so if we're no if if no one is invincible and i think me um miyamoto musashi talked about this if no mm -hmm. man is invincible no man can understand what can make him invincible i'm paraphrasing here yeah so nobody no more, one man has all the answers mm -hmm. so why would you just believe in your sensei he's one man because you need it. I mean, and yeah. we started this whole conversation based on, uh, on this idea that you got your sensei, you go to your sensei, and he's got all the answers. And we will look at that from the perspective of why the sensei does that, but which is which is important. But that's also looking at the perspective of what this why the students are doing it. It's because they need it. So how many people in any dojo of any martial arts hmm, uh, are what is the percentage of people that are actually engaged into, into a journey to be better as martial artists? Okay, and I want to talk about what is the goal of that in a second, but it's a very small percentage. Most people are just satisfied with what, we're do what they're doing in their dojo two, three times a week. Mm -hmm. and, and they want to meet, they want to be safe, so to speak, in that, in that environment. And thinking that that environment has everything they need. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, for the most people going into an Aikido dojo, it's okay if Aikido doesn't work in a cage. They don't care to begin mm -hmm. with if Aikido works in a cage. Because to make that question, you have to translate that practice into a bigger context. And they're not interested in that context. They're only interested in that small context. What does it do for them? And mm -hmm. if, if they getting the answer to what they need packed into this invincibility, that's so, that's so be it. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the problem? Okay, so one thing that I don't like, you know, and sometimes when people just poke the bear and say, well, you need to understand that this is not working because of this and that and this and that. I think, okay, I'm not interested. 
okay? I'm not, I'm, it's like when I'm drinking a, 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 you know, a glass of wine, I'm not interested in, in you telling me that it is bad or good for me or whatever. I'm just enjoying my wine, man. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> if I want that answer, I'm going to ask you. If it comes to me that I need to have that answer, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to do my own research. But most people that do Tai Chi uh, don't care about the practicality of Tai Chi. Most people that do Judo don't care about Atemi. They don't care about striking. Mm -hmm. They just care about Judo. They just care about practicing Judo. And then comes the guy and they say, well, what if I give you, you know, I put a strike, I give you, you know, a punch or, or a kick. He said, okay, we can, we can get into that conversation and I can, it's like a poker game, game. Okay. So you say, okay, I see your strike with a leg and I double down with a knife. What happened if I have a knife? I say, okay, I see your knife. What happened if I have a gun? And then we can construct this old thing and we go back to that invincibility of martial mm -hmm. arts. And, and, and to be honest, those questions are relevant, or at least they were relevant, at least the way I see it, if you're talking about 300, 400 years ago, when you really need to know these things to survive. But in mm -hmm. our society, what is the percentage of people that need to know how to disarm an automatic weapon? <laughs> You know, and, and I think that in, in the self-defense industry, I think they, there's a lot of fear mongering uh, oh gosh, there. That's and, great. and, and, and they, they play it up as though like, wow. And, and so a lot of people listening are going to disagree with this. They're going to say, hey, I grew up and, uh, you know, at every corner, there's the rape, uh, killing, you know, pillaging and, and, and people are getting robbed and shot. And, and it's like, you know, they live in a, essentially a war zone. Okay, uh, may, I, may I stop but, you there for a second? I'll yeah, stop yeah, you there yeah. for a second. If you look at the statistics, of people were taking martial art classes or self-defense classes, okay? And we, we crossed that, I, I did it, okay, I did. Um, in a few years ago, I had this project with my, my little research institute here at Chapman University, in which we actually pulled off all single self-defense and martial arts studios in the United States to the zip codes. So we had thousands of addresses, okay? And the discipline they were teaching. And then we cross-reference that with the FBI map of crime. And, and a, a fraction of a, of a, of a, of a cent of, of those studios were located in area where actual crime was happening. Because if somebody is busy to defend themselves from gang violence, hmm, this mm -hmm. guy are not, are gonna, are not gonna go into a fancy studio to learn any martial arts. <laughs> These guys are too busy to survive to learn your self-defense techniques. Mm. Okay, that's, that's a total myth. And yes, there might be somebody now close their eyes, but I live in this neighborhood and I got this dojo. Okay, yeah, it's you. Okay, don't bring an antidote on a data fight because that's, that's, I can't answer that question. So it's, it's more about the, the idea, what you were saying before, about before, though the fear mongering, about the idea of every place is hard, every place is, is dangerous, okay? Mm -hmm. I live in Irvine, California. It's probably the safest city on the planet, okay? <laughs> probably the galaxy, I don't know. I don't know about <laughs> other planets, but... And yet there's a lot of people, you know, they want to learn self-defense, they want to learn martial arts, they want to learn things. And yeah, okay, that's, that's fine. If that makes you feel safer, if that helps you, if in remote chance that you find a situation in which you can, you know, risk your life, you know how to disengage, you know how to negotiate your way out, you know, all those good things that we should be teaching in our self-defense classes to begin with. Uh, that's okay. I'm fine with that. But don't give me the thing that, you know, every place is his art and we all need to learn because there's a kidnapper be behind every corner. There, there's a guy with a knife behind every corner because that's not true. <laughs> I'm not saying to you, I'm saying to these people. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I agree. And, and that's why, like, I, um, where are they going with this? Like, this whole, like, the whole self defense industry, I find is, is, um, is overplayed. You know, and maybe, maybe some people, and of course, people who go do like, uh, take up these self-defense things, it's because something might, must have happened to them or something must have happened to someone they care about. And then they never want to relive that. So they want to 
be able to handle themselves, you know. Uh, but then after that, the schools, instead of like teaching them <clears throat> like, um, hmm, okay, maybe I shouldn't talk about this because it's not more, like self-defense is, isn't really my thing. Like I, I've gotten into, I've been in situations where, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I got, I, yeah, I've been in situations where, where two guys try to rob me and, uh, and I, I managed to get out of it, but it was pretty intense. Um, and, and yeah, there, but Honestly, where was I going with this? Um, I feel as though the schools, they don't, the people who come in to learn martial arts for self-defense, it's because they, they, they want that, they want to have, they want to be able to hand them themselves. They want to learn the skills and then they want to develop that confidence. But then the schools after that overplay, it. they make it sound like, you know, that, that you could learn, uh, you know, like uh, that, oh, you, you got to be always on high alert always mm -hmm. ready, ready to kill, ready for action. And, and you have to, you know, blah, blah, blah. You have to guide his eyes out and do this and do that. And I don't, and, and after that, but they don't, they don't explain to them that for you to be able to handle yourself, first of all, you have to be physically fit. Second of all, you have to be, it takes years to, to you know, and then to, to build up like confidence and actual skills that you'll be able to use under pressure. And for you, for you to be able to use under pressure, well, the only way to really replicate that is competition, the safest way, like the mm -hmm. way some clubs do it, like, ah, oh, they, no, like you can't, uh, you can't replicate that. Like in, in, uh, it's very hard to replicate in, a, in, a, in, in, um, in a dojo, you know? Oh, well, it's, it's, it's impossible. I, I think like, it's impossible to replicate. I think you're, you're on uh, to something you're really right when you say that the kind of tension of having physical confrontation with someone that is trying to hurt you in a way, of course, they're not trying to hurt you, but that can be a byproduct of they're trying to prevail on you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's an approximation, but but it's not in a sense that it's also consensual violence. Mm -hmm. So in, in in martial arts studies, we we talk about you know the difference between consensual and non-consensual violence, and any competition is consensual violence, you know, mm -hmm. because it's bounded by rules. And and even the my MMA fight, even the UFC fights, that's consensual. Mm -hmm violence okay mm -hmm. no one of them is trying to kill the other okay mm -hmm. I, I think that's that's one thing that i hear sometimes so, oh you know we want to train with real killers that these are not real killers that's 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 a mistake made by joe rogan i think in one of his podcasts where he was mm -hmm. talking to bas and he was saying well train people train to be killers they're not trained to be killers mm -hmm. okay some they can kill people yes of course are they trained to be killers no because that's not what they're doing. They're training okay. for a sport. <laughs> they're trained for sport. <laughs> to win it's a body, sport. violent sport, but it's consensual violence. But you're right. That's the best approximation. Everything else is either not even close or it's abuse. And, mm -hmm. and, and you see that in, in some schools of self-defense, you've seen, you know, there's some examples. Of course, I don't like to throw out names because I don't want to be legally responsible for anything. But there are some schools out there of self-defense, extreme self-defense, who put their students through abuse. And it's not a, we have people training with live rounds. Uh, and, yeah. and, and everybody knows what we're talking about here, but that, again, I don't want to make any, any full pie here. Well, and, for, and for, for anybody who listening, who wants to go check that stuff out, make Dojo Life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Best channel. Yeah. For, oh, see, like, is amazing. Mc yeah. yeah is amazing. Pure shenanigans, you know, like yeah. not, not, not make Dojo Life, but you know, he, he, yeah, he calls them out like, you know, hardcore. And, and I think he does a great job because, you know, some, like, I guess somebody has to do it and, and, you know, that's his thing, you know, and it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. When you see people using live rounds, to... no, man. no, it's, no. So and it's not preparing to you to do anything. It's not, it's, it's, it's not that it gives you, you, you're lucky enough to survive that training experience and nowadays now you can just do whatever you want you feel like yourself a superhero because that's now how it that's not how it works so the violence that is non-consensual violence cannot be replicated mm -hmm. okay it can only be replicated through non-consensual violence and and that's you have to ask yourself why you want to do that uh what is your goal but you're right when people come to our place and say i'm interested in doing this because i want to learn how to defend myself i think they're coming with a baggage and I think the instructor responsibility should be to understand and help the students to figure out what they want to do and, and sort of like move over, move on. 
as opposed yeah, as mm -hmm. as nailing the head of that nail of that and and, and you know, hammering the, the head of that nail and 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 increase the level of tension or create the level of tension to begin with from, from scratch by by just suggesting that we live in a hard you know in a very dangerous place and again things happen so if you're prepared mm -hmm. that's that's fine uh but it shouldn't be i mean in my opinion it shouldn't be your goal it shouldn't be it shouldn't be what you're doing and i understand the industry uh, yeah. i understand the industry of self-defense i partake that industry in a way because i teach martial art classes so i think in a way i'm part of the problem myself uh but i think there are individuals out there they're, they're taking this this too much and they're, they're creating people that you know Kind of over paranoid. the edge all the time. Yes. Over paranoid. the edge, paranoid, always on high alert, always like, you know, like, you know, ready to kill somebody and just waiting, waiting for that opportunity kind of because like they're trained to, to see everything as a threat. And mm -hmm. like the way, and, and I like what you said regarding how like if uh, a student comes and then he wants to learn martial arts because he wants to hand it himself, you said he comes he, with some baggage. So the instructor's <laughs> job is to help him get over that baggage through martial arts, through training, you know? Yeah. And training martial arts to me is a, uh, it's a journey of self-mastery. Mastering your body, your mind, your emotions through learning how to fight. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's yeah. just a tool. It's, I'm not trying to make you like, it shouldn't be to try to make you into a violent human being, uh, a crazy weapon that has absolutely no control over himself. Mm -hmm. Because that's 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 the last thing you want. Because then you're going to get yourself into so much trouble if you become a dangerous weapon with no control. You become a weapon, and and you have so much violence in you because you've been brainwashed a certain way. What do you do? You go out in society and you do crazy stuff, and you're going to harm yourself, and you're going to harm other people, and you end up in jail, and you could end up dead, and then it ruins your life that way. Because if you're always you're thinking, oh, gonna, oh, this guy's looking at me. Oh yeah, what if he has it? You know, I'm gonna. <laughs> Hey, it, ruins, that? <laughs> it ruins your life it ruins your life in my experience it ruins your life on so many levels the one level what you're saying that directly ruins your life because you're going to get engaged into into a violence confrontation mm -hmm. sooner or later if that's what you're looking for it's what you're going to find okay so you're going to create maybe maybe not in the, the deliberate way but you're going to create the conditions for you to get into that fight okay mm -hmm. that that is going to happen but even before that, you ruin your social relations. You're going to become a violent person at home with your family. You're going to become a violent person, a violent person in your workplace. You're going to lose opportunities. You're going to, you know, it's, it's going to be, uh, again, we go back into the cultish idea. It's going to be you, your little club of people that understand what you're doing mm -hmm. and, and, and no one else. And uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a dangerous path. Oh, yeah. 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 That's why, like, I, um, you know, the more we talk about it, the more I, I start to um, uh, my ideas start to to make more sense regarding that. And yeah, so so that's that's the danger I find with um, the whole self-defense thing, you know, and, and mm -hmm. like, you know, my mom always said something um, and she, and and it translates to if you go out at night a lot, you're going to meet ghosts. Right. So what, what she means by that. Uh, cause she says it in Vietnamese, uh, but it means that like, if you go out looking for problems and you go out to places where there's, there's, you know, high level, like high risk of having problems, then yeah, you're going to find problems. You know, yeah. you hang out at bars all the time. You hang around with people who take drugs and, and stuff like that. And you go out late and you, you go to after hours and you, you go to these, uh, you know, like, what do you think is going to happen? Of course, there's going to be something, you know, but if you, um, if you, if you wake up in the morning, go to work come home, go train, come home afterwards, have, have dinner, go to bed. What are the chances of you getting into it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, maybe, I, I, maybe you go into the metro, the subway, you know, in, in, in certain uh, areas, uh, certain, like, I don't know. I don't know if New York is dangerous or not, but you go uh, to the subway I, and then there's crazy people I mean, and you go into those ghettos, but they just avoid the damn ghetto. Like do a, do a detour. You know, that's my mindset. It's like, if you know a place is dangerous, don't try to train and then, okay, I'm going to train self-defense and become a, a crazy person and, 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 and uh, walk around with a knife or a gun or something like that. Like, why don't you just bypass it? It might be a pain in the butt. It might take you longer to get to where you want to go, but that's how you win. You win a battle without fighting it. That's the best yeah. way to win a battle. Sun Tzu, right? Like, you know, <laughs>
<laughs> why do you want to go into the unknown? Like if you know something is uh, there's danger here because there's a lot of criminal activity or it's there's so much poverty going on and people are just out of their minds, a lot of drugs going on, you avoid the situation. Obviously, you know, as Look, much I mean, as you can. It's you know? it's okay. So first of all, I, I think you can still go to a bar once in a while. It's not gonna. Oh yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah. It's not gonna hurt you. Uh-huh. <laughs> but so no, I I understand with uh, I, and I and I agree with you, especially what you said about, which is something that always, it's not always, but I'm I'm trying to find the right words here, but it kind of makes me laugh of some people in in the self defense and also martial arts industry, in which they construct this artificial scenario. And, and and present them and I, and I think not a lot of people point that out I think I think one of the people that point it out very often is IC Mike I, I think IC Mike is one of my favorite youtuber when we get to martial arts because he's got this little nugget more than once of, of truth about thing of, of pure insight and 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 one one time he said something about artificial scenario that are constructed uh, you know, people pointing a gun, you know, to your head or, or you know, an a, AK-47 AK, AK uh, to your back. Say, like, that doesn't happen, okay? That's, that's not how that violence work. And the other artificial scenario, which I think is more subtle and it's, it's, it's less, it's more pervasive too and it's less acknowledged, is the dual scenario. And that comes right out of, I think, the idea we have of fighting within competition, especially with the MMA or UFC, in which you have these two contenders, they're fighting each other because at some point they got into a confrontation. That's not how it works, okay? Mm-hmm. That's, that's the last part of a whole process that brought both of you there. And in that competition, things are level, okay? You are in a cage or a ring, you know what the other guy is doing because you know their stats, they know your stats, you know your strength, weakness, and stuff. And so there's no weapons involved, there's nothing in the terrain that is involved. So that is a duel. Okay. And people think that that the duel scenario is what applies to uh, uh, you know to self-defense, with the only difference that you got ambushed and the other guy might have a superior's uh, uh, um, force multiplier, whatever is, you know, is a bat or a knife Mm -hmm. or or everything. Uh, That's again, not how it works because as you were saying before, a lot of other things led both of you there, especially you there to be in that subway at that very moment when you realize that was not the right place for you to be. And if we look at warfare, that's not how war works. In, in war, it's not just the battle, it's what happened before. So the Romans were so good at winning, were they because they were the best, mightiest, stronger individuals? I mean, a Roman legionnaire was on average 130 centimeters, 130, 140 centimeters, okay? Yes, wow. they, were, they, were, they were strong and stuff, they were well-armed, but was, what was that allowed Rome to win so many battles. They were planning. They were, you know, they were fighting where they were the strongest. At the time, they were the strongest. With, with, with opponents, they were defeatable because they understand that they were weaker than them. So every general likes to engage in a battle where they know exactly where they're going and whether they know exactly if they're going to win or not. No general or no military person would like to take their chances Mm -hmm. in 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 a physical confrontation that's simply not how it works okay planning an operation it's the most important part of the whole fight Mm -hmm. and 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 that you know again that works too with uh with with uh still with mma or or ring fighting because you're planning to get there but in the self-defense that this idea that you have to be constantly prepared and you have to face these in that scenario you have to find yourself no that's 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 fantasy yeah yeah you're right about that and i think like the only thing you could do like if you're concerned with self-defense is that you want to train your body, you want to train your mind, and then you want to essentially understand like, okay, 
where these potential situations can happen. And for the most part, like you want to see, be able to read the situation, be good at, obviously yeah. you have to be aware, you know, and, and you have to be able to read situations and get out of that situation as soon as, as quickly as you can. Once you determine that, okay, something's going down this, you know, and, and of course, um, and then once you're in it already, then I, I guess there's certain techniques you can look at, like you could try to diffuse the situation. You can kind of try to catch the guy off guard, you know, you know, and so on and so on. But I mean, then you get into like minutia that, that might help, but I think it's more important. The other stuff um, that I mentioned beforehand to be established first, you know, yeah. and, and then, yeah. And if things happen, Hey, like you don't know what's going to happen. You don't, you never know who, who, who you're going up against, uh, what kind of variables there are around and it's going to be, it's going to be dangerous. You know, it's going to like, it could end bad for, you know, it could end bad for you, for him, for both, whatever, you know? So I think that, yeah, like, um, that's why these, these self-defense, um, sometimes you see like these self-defense schools or self-defense videos and stuff like that. It's always, like you said, like, like I see Mike said, right. It's, it's, um, I forgot the term you use, but they just make up a situation. Yeah. They just, <laughs> they, like, you know, they, they're, it's not they're going to happen that way. You know, it's, there's, you know? they're scenario based. And I, I, again, I, I don't have anything about anything against scenario based. Uh, I think that's, let me rephrase that. Uh, I come with a traditional martial art background. So for me, it's more about principle than, than scenarios and applications. So I understand mm -hmm. that competitive martial arts and, you know, and, and let's say functional martial arts have a different take of that, but it's slightly different. It's not completely different. And then you have these oddballs in, this, in the, in, in, in the self-defense industry. They're, they're working on scenario based. Now, there's nothing wrong with scenario based as long as the scenarios are realistic and as long as they're complete. But most of the time, they're very specific. Last part of what is going to happen. So you're already in a confrontation and they're fantasy based. That's, that's my, my big issue with uh with most of these classes not all these classes okay they're they're very good people out there they're they're working you know they're very they're evolving they're they're very attentive to uh neuropsychological implications conflict theory conflict resolution theories and all these other things that they teach that but for the most part what you see in youtube and maybe it's because of the medium you see these now this guy is going to point the knife at your throat and you're going to move that way. You're going to strike the groin and you're going to do this. And you're going to do that. And I will say, oh, okay. And maybe there's nothing wrong with the technique itself. Okay. Like what's that guy, Detroit dust. Okay. That, 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 the guy that now is, uh, is all, all over YouTube with, with Mimi and, and stuff like that. That camo guy, the, the, the tactical guy, right? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I never, I haven't watched some any of his videos. I thought he was so. I actually thought that he was somebody uh, that uh, that was actually being serious. And 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 then no, no, know, he's serious. He's serious. Fun of him. If people is making fun of them, uh, and and to a certain extent, unrightfully so, because some of the things that he teaches in terms of technique per se, they're mm -hmm. pretty standard in law enforcement. Uh, and and they're, they're okay. There's nothing wrong, but the, the whole paraphernalia, the whole setup that he has is what, it, in my opinion, makes him a little too open to be laughed at. Wait, I, I'm not sure if we're talking about the same guy because I, I saw this. Um, the guy uh, from Detroit. Detroit, he's dressed up kind of like a cop. And then, yeah, yeah. And, exactly. and then I, he was featured, like, he recently, I think he did a, a video with, um, what was his name there? Uh, Master Ken. <laughs> Yeah, Mary yeah, probably. Is, is that yeah. him? Is that him? Yeah, probably him. I, I didn't okay. see the video with Master Ken, uh, but yeah, it's but a guy he's, with... uh, he, he's a black gentleman, right? Like, uh, yes, exactly. Okay, okay, and he wears like he looks like he's wearing yeah. a cop gear and he has gloves on and he, like exactly, like, exactly. Yeah, cop like, that's, uh, the whole the tactical okay, okay, okay. thing. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, like he's actually doing serious stuff and people are making fun of him, or he's doing yeah, like no, he's doing, he's doing Master stuff. Ken stuff. No, I thought he was no, doing no, Master no. Ken stuff, no, like just fooling around. No, no, he's doing serious stuff, and and there are serious stuff that he teaches. But again, my concern is, is, is how the whole thing is set up. As it, I, I, think, I think some of the things that he teaches might be okay, 
but and I'm no expert. Again, I'm talking uh, is that like these guys saying yeah, like we're, we're allowed to have our opinions. That's yeah, what people don't so understand, right? They're like, oh, some people say, uh, shut the blah blah up because you know, like uh, you don't know what you're talking about. You never, you know, it's like yeah, but we're talking. We yeah, I probably don't know what I'm talking about. For, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but the, everyone's allowed to voice their opinion and that, that's what uh that's what podcast that's what youtube that's what everything is about so like even if we don't know what we're talking about at 100 percent, we're allowed to have our opinion on it based on what we do know and then of course we evolve and then you know uh, i've said things before where uh i've got criticized for a little bit and then after that i changed my mind because i learned more information so to me it's no big deal and uh, there's still people commenting on some videos I did a long time ago regarding <laughs> Iron Palm. And you're an idiot. You don't know. You never tried it. Yeah. You know, like you're going to break your hand and blah, blah. I'm like, oh, God. You know, I'm like, whatever. I don't even answer them because I'm like, dude, that's a video from like three years ago. Like, whatever. You know, it's okay. Yeah. It's no, I, I, I get it. No, I, I understand. That's why I'm, I'm putting my disclaimer here that I might <laughs> be completely wrong about this. But uh, that, that's what, that is what concerned me in the whole self-defense industry, not just him, the whole self-defense industry is set up on, it's, it's feeds on fear. Mm -hmm. It supports, you know, the spread of fears in society, which are otherwise, you know, increasingly safe, um, increase the tension. And then the answer and the solution is sometimes based on these fake understanding of how violence Mm -hmm. Is how, how we get to violence, not how we deal with violence. Because again, mm -hmm. this guy might be absolutely right. And there's a few cops that commented on and say, well, we actually do those things and they work in our line of work. Mm -hmm. Again, doesn't mean that works in every, it, what works for law enforcement, it's not automatically translatable into self-defense. That's, that's mm -hmm. all, all the, other, the other thing. But whatever that is, I'm not commenting on the technique per se. I'm commenting on, we probably we have an imaginative view of how we get to violence and how prevalent violence is. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, that has nothing to do with, uh, with technical and, and, and thing. The other, the other thing, the other side of the argument is that, well, but then martial arts don't teach you how to deal with self-defense. It's like, yeah, okay. Um, first of all, they were not designed for that. So it's like, you're telling me that, that you know, you can't you can use a fork to open a door yeah, I know. Okay, what's your point? Uh, so martial arts were not designed to deal with that, but there are things in martial arts, even traditional martial arts, that can be translated with work into making you better in, in, in handling yourself and defending yourself in a situation, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing that it kind of comes to my mind when we're talking about we're getting into this territory, with, you also mentioned like dojo life, uh, which does amazing video, but I, I think the whole rhetoric of that thing will get you killed is, is really overrated because oh. no, none of those things will get you killed. I mean, show me the number of people who trained with Dillman and got killed because they trained with Dillman. It's, it's, train it's with not what? a train with, uh, you said Dillman, Dillman, Dillman. yes. Oh, that that touch, that that touch guy. Oh, okay, 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 okay. okay. So, well, you mean that you, you don't agree with? Uh, you find if you don't agree with when when he makes videos about like, okay, if you do this for self defense, it'll get you killed. But uh, uh, I I don't agree with the whole the whole question. Okay, uh, and uh, okay, so get, let me let me get this straight. If you try to stop a bullet or dodge a bullet, okay. Uh, let's say dodge a bullet. Let's not get into the, the, the whole chi balls sort of conversation. Let's say something that might be more attainable. And as Ramsey Dewey said once, you're not faster than a bullet. So if you try to dodge a bullet, you're going to get a bullet. You're going to get killed. Okay. Mm -hmm. To that extent, if you're going around trying to dodge bullets, that is going to get you killed. Yeah. Yeah. But in terms of in terms of the number of times that that happens, I think it's close to zero. So most people, again, 99% of people, we're talking about maybe those, we're not talking about the people we were talking before that will try and find, okay, if you, uh, let me rephrase this. I, I know this is a podcast, so probably have to cut this whole thing. But uh, <laughs> because I'm, I'm, this is brain farts, I'm, 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 I'm trying to verbalize what I think. No, no, I don't cut anything. Yeah. I just let it. <laughs> most of work. these, most, <laughs> most of the people 
will never get to try those things, mm. okay? And even if they got into violence, they're not gonna get killed because they try a fancy technique. They're gonna get killed because they found themselves into a situation that put them at risk of living, of, mm. of losing their life, okay? And at that point, if somebody gets, so first of all, to prove that statement, you have to show me the number of people that actually got killed because they did that technique or the other thing. There's the only way to prove it, right? That's the only way, scientifically speaking, if you're saying that crossing the street at midnight will get you killed, you have to show me the number of people who A, crossed the street at midnight and got killed, and B, crossed the street at midnight and didn't get killed, and C, people that crossed the street at any other time and got killed or not killed. So that's how a scientific experiment works. There's no other way around, okay? So that old that thing will get you killed, I think is a little bit overpowered. Now, yeah. that doesn't mean that I'm criticizing my dojo life because he's doing a great job in, in exposing charlatans. Mm-hmm. And, and that, is a, that is a public service job because some people <laughs> might go into- An essential service. <laughs> yeah, some people might go into some of those cults, don't realize what they're doing and just, you know, get hooked into that, get hooked into those fancy techniques, maybe to think and try if they work or not. And for sure, putting a lot of money into that. Now, as he said all the time, my no. dojo life, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. Be happy, okay? <laughs> if you want to, if you if you want to put hundreds of dollars a month into a school that teaches you how to be a ninja, and at the end of the process you feel better because you feel like a ninja, I'm happy about it, okay? I'm happy for you, but the service part comes when there's people that might not quite know what they're buying into. Yeah. Okay. And so it's, it's good for people like him or others to say, this is not working. So, um, and it's good for people like Roka saying the same thing about Aikido and say, well, if you're looking at Aikido as the magical technique, beware it's not. Mm -hmm. Are you happy with what you find there? Go ahead. You're not find something else. What I don't like is the people pointing in, you know, in the comment section that this is bullshit, this is bullshit, this is bullshit. Then nobody should be doing that. Or nobody should be doing that thing. Those, mm-hmm. those things will get you killed because that's simply not true. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I, 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 like, I like what you're saying. I like your point of view on that. Like, you got to show me the numbers, you know, like how many people really die from this? Like, where's, where's the data, right? Yeah, because you just say it like that. It's like, nah, nothing. And and and, get, and again, it's something. It, it's something that along I, the I, line of, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, like, uh, I think the the biggest thing that kills people are car accidents. <laughs> oh yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> you know, so so so, uh, like, uh, I might be mistaken, but you know, like I I've heard that you know car accidents is like the one of the number one killers in like on the planet, you know, or 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 in America or something like that. So. That's how you're gonna die. <laughs> That's how you're gonna get killed. You're not. You, it's not some I, guy I, pointing a gun and shooting at you. You know, like what are you, yeah. a gangster? You know, like even the. I I think I think eating too much bacon is the second cause. It's a heart attack for sure. It's <laughs> it's it's probably which you get from a lot of things that you do in life that are far more dangerous than you know spending a couple of hours into into a dojo learning how to do ninja stuff or how to throw bow shoot again or whatever, that's not going to get you killed. The other thing that you're doing are probably going to get you killed more. Uh, we're talking about the extreme, okay? Mm-hmm. The extreme case scenario, which you're going to be engaged in non consexual violence, which is very unlikely. You want to be prepared somehow with that? Okay, you can. But it is something that is not going to happen to you on a daily basis. And if it happens to you on a daily basis, because of your line of work, for example, you're gonna be doing other things to begin with mm-hmm. to protect you from that. Okay, like you know, weapon handling or whatever that you you do to begin mm-hmm. uh, to begin with. But the, the the other is 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 very inconsequent. What you do is very inconsequential mm-hmm. it, to 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 your to the chances to the probability for you to engage in, to be engaging in non consensual violence. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> so there, there's one another thing that I want to say that I want to say about uh, about that. I, I, it kind of slipped my mind. Probably wasn't that important, but I th- I feel it was important. I want to say something about the whole uh, the whole 
self-defense and uh, uh, you know things are gonna get you killed and, and, and stuff like that. But maybe, maybe I don't know. Maybe it'll, it'll come back that. to you. It'll come back to you. Yeah, yeah. but and, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it was hey. something. Go ahead. Hey, we got to talk about because um, we were talking about like you know um, that one thing that you mentioned that martial arts wasn't designed for self-defense. That's really interesting. I never thought of that that way, but in my mind, when, when you said that, I understand that, well, yeah, because martial arts was for warfare and for war, war was for the most part planned out, you know, and they knew what they were getting into. They knew their numbers. They knew, well, I'm guessing a good general would want to know his numbers, you know, like how many soldiers he had, how many the enemy had, you know, where we're fighting off and we're trying to trap them. We're trying to flank them. We're trying to like uh, get them by surprise and win, mm -hmm. you know? So, so, and martial arts in general, like martial arts was for war, was designed for war, right? In a time where people were uh, fighting that way, right? Like feudal mm -hmm. Japan and then whatever the Romans and this, that. But then of course you could use elements of that and, and use it for martial arts. I mean, for self-defense. So that's fine, but it's, it's not, uh, it wasn't designed for, for self-defense. So self-defense is another thing on its own, but then it's very hard to train for because it's, it's just not, um, you can't predict when it's going to happen. You can't really prepare for that. You could prepare yourself physically as best you can and mentally, you know, um, and, and all and have the skills. But I mean, when it goes down, it's just going to be a question of um, how you're able to react uh, to the situation and uh, mm -hmm. at that moment in time and so also what I want to get to okay is uh, you know we're talking about like war and and, and, and self-defense and all that DKU okay had Ooh. his had his match you're aware of this right had his match yeah. against uh, Brad and I was gonna make a video on this but I'm like you know what let's let's talk about it here because <laughs> I'll give my opinion you give your opinion we'll have uh, you know we'll have some fun conversations regarding him and then we can get back to Rokis too, because I really do think that Rokis, um, uh, like, I think you're onto something when, like, you said he traded one cult for another, and now he's like completely, you know, uh, MMA, functional martial arts only, and everything else is nonsense. And then he goes back and forth on that. And I feel that, and I understand his journey because I think I, I went through that myself. But at this time, at this point, I feel as though I I went full circle, you know, mm -hmm. in, in terms of my understanding and acceptance of what. Um, martial arts is you know like this and like you said dead languages can still be learned and preserved but yeah. you know you you take it for what it is and then after that if you could take something out of it and use it fine but you know it's not it's not the same thing it's you know sport is sport and then war is war and self-defense is like another little uh yeah. thing on the side there you know so let, let's let's start with um dku what's your okay what's your uh, let me let me get match? to the i i want to i want to actually point Point something out when you say war, war and self-defense. So martial arts were were born. At least we're talking about traditional martial arts. Uh, most of them were born out of a warfare. So I think that the closest thing, the only thing that I think in the Japanese context, as as originated out of self-defense purposes, is Okinawa and karate. And and Jesse and Camp is doing a great job in pointing out how you know karate. Karate actually started out there, but when we're talking about the modern incarnation, the the goal were completely different. So Funakoshi had pedagogical goals, like Jigoro Kano had sportish pedagogical goal with his with his judo. And we're talking about Gendai Buddha, so we're talking about modern martial arts. Same thing for Kendo, same thing for Aikido. So these things were even past warfare. If we go in, it was something completely new within society. If we, if we go into the old school of martial arts, like old traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu, for example. The other big difference is there that comes from martial art from warfare is that these were not meant to be empty-ended system. The empty-ended component was strained on top of what am I going to do with my weapons? Because battlefield, you're not gonna go empty-ended, okay? This is not Fist of the North Star can in which you can just explode people by punching them in the face. This is warfare. You want to be with your weapons, your force multipliers. Okay. You want to have those extensions. You want to have your bow. You want to have like bow and arrow. You want to have your spears. You want to have your sword. You want to have your dagger or knife. And if you see some of those martial arts, like Aikido, for example, there's this idea that 90% of Aikido is a tami, et cetera, et cetera. And they just put these punches here and there. 
And that's okay, that's fine. We do that all the time. But keep in mind that most of the strikes were meant to be done with a weapon. We're meant to be done with a dagger. Why are you punching here? And people say, why are you punching my armpit in Aikido? Like, that's silly. You're not going to punch anybody like this in an armpit and pretend that this guy just fall around. Well, think twice. Think if I have a blade in my hand and I put there when there's a space that is not covered by your armor. So that was in traditional jiu-jitsu and other things. So that's the difference between warfare, self-defense, and things. Uh, now I go back to what was your other question, DK? Uh, well, yeah, DK. Yeah. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think of the match? What do you think, think of he, him? And uh, yeah. Your I think he won. I think he won. And the reason why he won is because everything was set up for him to win. And he was a stunt. It was a publicity stunt, very well designed, very good from his part. And I respect his entrepreneurial uh, insight into mm -hmm. setting up that fight. Um, he wanted to prove the point that he could survive in a match with, with a mixed martial artist. And he did. Now, I know that people will start yelling at me and say, but he did this, but the hugs, but this, but the referees, but this and this and this and this. And you got these other YouTubers, they say he desecrated the sacred sport of boxing. Yes, so did Gracie in UFC 1. <laughs> Wasn't UFC 1 a whole stunt? We, we know that that's history, okay? And it's not me mm -hmm. saying, there's other people saying that former referees at the UFC one that admitted they were paid by the organization, which was the Gracie's, mm -hmm. into creating a situation in which he would prevail. Now, and then the second question will be, but he was a better martial artist than DKO. Oh, okay, that's not what I'm saying, okay? That's, I'm not comparing the martial artists and the arts and the value of their teaching. I'm just saying that they were both events that were organized to promote a certain player, a certain practitioner. And on that level, I put him on the same level. Okay. Mm, and the, this okay. DKO thing is UFC one uh, all over. For, uh, for self-defense guys. For self-defense guys versus MMA, guys. MMA fighter. And, and of course. <laughs> in, in a boxing match, which doesn't make sense because it doesn't if you're a make sense. self-defense guy and you're an MMA guy, why are we doing boxing? Let's, 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 let's bare knuckle it and... Okay, does it make sense for for the UFC one to have Gracie with wearing his gi, but nobody else could wear their shin guards or their boxing gloves? The, the striker, the kickboxer couldn't wear his thing. Oh, I wasn't okay. aware they weren't allowed to, to wear no. whatever they want. No, 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 no. It was very specific of what they could have. Okay, okay. And okay. oh, recruiting a so-called sumo fighter <laughs> and then, bro and then you know, wasn't really a sumo fighter. But and then, if he was a sumo fighter, you throw him off the game, the match before because you don't want him to compete. Because just by sitting on him, it would have mm -hmm. won the match against Gracie. So uh, there's a video of Jesse Yankem that that talks about this and gets into the specific of what happened. And you know, that's history. And Again, that has nothing to do with the quality of BJJ. Okay, mm -hmm. that's not how, the, the, the misunderstanding is that by setting up this false experiment, you could prove something on something else. That's not how science works. That's not how experiment work. You know, this is at the very least, if you don't cook the results, this is pure empiricism. This is like, let's try and see what sticks. That has nothing to do with science. So you cannot prove anything with that. And in this particular case, when you have the KO or the AFC one, it's something that is designed to produce a certain result. And the only thing you can say is whether or not they produce the result or not. Okay, so, so you think he, was, he won because he was successful in essentially promoting his, himself and, and showing yeah. that, hey, I survived against a heavier opponent uh, uh, you know, and, um, yeah. And, and, and essentially I was injured and blah, 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 blah. So I, yeah. you know, hmm. absolutely. I think my opinion is that on that level, if you're talking about who won uh -huh. from a, from a media communication perspective, mm -hmm. he won. That's hands down. 
insane insane but but like the people who who actually look at that fight and who are who know what they're looking at but i'm assuming i'm thinking here the people who follow him religiously probably don't know what they're looking at anyway but the people yeah. who know what they're looking at know that obviously he was uh uh he didn't get the upper hand in that fight at all of and course yeah but but i mean he's gonna spin it the way he's gonna spin it obviously because uh, technically you know, speaking technically mm-hmm. speaking if you know what you're looking at uh-huh. and, and again i understand Ramsey Dewey going in and be bad about that because oh yeah yeah Ramsey Ra- Ramsey freaked out. <laughs> he understands boxing. Mm-hmm. Okay, he he understands fighting. He understands uh, mixed martial arts. He understands traditional martial arts. He understands self defense. He understands boxing. He understands all these things. And if you look at that from the perspective of once a person that's trying to evaluate what's happened from a technical perspective. Yeah, got to be mad about it. There's no other way around. You have to be mad about it. You mean because you, he played the rules or? Um... Because of all the things that he did, okay? Oh, everything yeah. that he did. But if you look at that from a communication perspective, wow, he did everything that he was supposed to do from a propaganda marketing point of view. He yeah. excelled that way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and I you know that's that's the way I see it because I don't know boxing as you know as as you know as much as Ramsey Dewey does I don't mm-hmm. I don't know the intricacy of MMA and the rules and and the conduct and everything so I can't have that, um, that mm-hmm. I, my opinion will work nothing uh, okay. in, in in that in with that respect but from a communication from a scholarly communication perspective uh yeah i i think i think he won I, i'm sorry i i think <laughs> you know i know people won't like this answer but i you know I think oh yeah won. yeah he, he probably uh he'll probably get more uh, you know i think that i think that might be true in the sense that like he's gonna get more follow followers he's gonna get more people you know like uh more students he's gonna do more seminars you're gonna you know like uh it's gonna boost his business and you know i i always wonder like though like, why did he even want to do a fight? Because I feel as though it was never in his best interest to go, um, you know, to go into a match like that where he could potentially get knocked out and that could like pretty in the first round, in the first, you know, first minute. And then after that, that would technically ruin his business, you know? Mm-hmm. But I think now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, okay, he wanted, either he was delusional or he wanted to prove something. He really wanted to prove something to the world delusional in the sense that he really thought that he could do something no I don't think um, so. mm. or maybe um he went in thinking that okay publicity st- like he's gonna do all this it's, it's essentially a big publicity stunt and then from there he rigged it so that he wouldn't get knocked out you know and i think that this is good this is gonna be this is gonna sound a little bit uh maybe a little bit crazy but i think that brad had all the intentions of knocking him out, like they mm-hmm. were saying, uh, you know, like uh, leading up to the fight, you know, and it wasn't a long lead up. I mean, they they they, they had the um, uh, they had the date and everything, and the fight set up in like I think a week or less than a week or something like that. Or two which weeks. which tells you something. Yeah, 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 of course. He was like he didn't want him to be prepared. He didn't want him to get enough sleep, and uh, you know, all kinds of stuff, right? <clears throat> so where was I getting at? So I think that Brad wanted to knock him out, but then, and that was the plan. That's what they were training for. And then when they got to Korea, like there was a lot of, the, at a press conference, uh, like there was some other, uh, uh, it, during the, the press conference, there was like this, uh, this, this, this uh, Korean kick, high level kickboxer that was calling out Brad, telling him, why are you like picking on somebody smaller than you? It's me and you fight instead and blah, 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 blah. And after that, they, they, they felt as though like the guys from Fight Bible, Brad and, and his, uh, his, his partner, I forgot his name. Uh, is it Joe? Is that, mm, is that his name? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, well, let's, call him Joe for, yeah. let's call him Joe for now. So. Yeah, just for now. <laughs> you guys could correct me in the comments if I'm not yeah, absolutely. If I'm mistaken. But they were saying that they felt as though like they were trying to use that press conference to set up, um, to set up uh, uh, the whole narrative that Brad is being a bully and mm-hmm. that and set up that next fight uh, with the, the other opponent. Right. Mm-hmm. But then after that, I think Brad like handled that well. And he said, listen, he's the one who, you know, reached out to me. Like I offered to, 
I called him out and challenged him, but he, he's the one who said yes and brought me here, knowing full well that I'm a lot bigger than him. So, and we're doing, you know, we're doing mm -hmm. a, a boxing match. We're doing everything according to what he wants to do. Um, but I feel as though, and Brad mentioned this, that after that, he spoke to the organizer of that event. And the organizer of that event has like a, like I think the biggest chain of gyms in, in Korea. And he had his uh, logo and everything plastered on, on, on the floor of the boxing ring. Mm -hmm. And he said to Brad, like, um, uh, you know, oh, I hope, you know, can you please make it last long enough so that people could see my logo <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> and they probably had some kind of conversation with that. And I mean, that guy's a rich man, right? Now, if you help a rich man out and do him a favor, he might help you out afterwards. You know, it's, it's kind of that thing. And then I think that a lot of people, even on, on, on DKU side was talking to Brad and Joe and telling them, please don't kill him. Please don't kill him. Be nice. And then DKU himself was a very nice guy. And I think that Brad kind of understood that there was more opportunity for him. Like he could prove a point that he could yeah. beat him. He could beat him up, but he didn't have to knock him out and embarrass him because mm -hmm. it would, he had more to gain to make it last as long as it did and, and not, uh, not destroy him in the first minute. And still prove his point because then after that it opens up doors. Now he has that match coming up potentially with, uh, you know. So on a business perspective, I think Brad did the right thing, you know, uh, for himself, and he proved the point. Like he, he, like anybody who knows what they're looking at knew that DK, um, you know, like had no chance, and Brad was like having mercy on him. You know, mm -hmm. he didn't want it at any time in that fight. He could have just. Even if uh, DK was hugging him, get a pushed him up, pushed him off. Really, you know, the weight difference. Weight is a big issue. is a is a serious factor in fighting. He could have pushed him off and knocked him out. You know, like mm -hmm. a two three punch combo. Like really pushed him off hard and crack him while he was like bouncing off the ropes or whatever. He could have done that anytime he wanted to, but he didn't. Um, mainly because he wanted to prove his point without knocking him out, and at the same time, it would benefit him uh, to be. Um, uh, you know, to be in good, in good standing with, uh, with everybody there. And, but then there's a lot of guys who criticize them for that. Like, Hey, what happened? How come you didn't knock him out and stuff? Red Chucks, my buddy, Red Chucks. I don't know if you know Red Chucks. No. Okay. He's a, he's a multiple time champion concrete breaker. So this is like a little shout out to him. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. He's on YouTube too. So he breaks concrete with his bare fists. Oh, and his wow. elbow and he kicks it and he, and he, and he has the world like he, he he's a champion like there's events for this and yeah he's a champ huge guy huge guy has uh he's like i think six foot uh six foot five um so red chucks you could correct me if i'm wrong <laughs> when you watch this clip and he's about i think he's about 265 pounds and he's he's pretty lean too at that weight like hmm. and um lifetime martial artist also you know uh very awesome. into it awesome and yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's, he studied jet, jet can do and all kinds of stuff. And yeah, he's very, he's a very cool guy. Um, and he was, he was saying that like as much as he's friends with Brad's too, you know, like they talk and all. And he was saying that like, if you want to prove somebody to be a fraud and that's what Brad was saying the whole time, I'm going to prove that this guy doesn't know what, what the hell he's talking about. I'm just going to knock him out. So Red Chucks was saying, you got to knock him out. You got to go in there and knock him the hell out. And if you didn't, now all of a sudden, like you're giving room for everybody else to see. See, see, DK managed to survive. He's, his system works. He blah, 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 and so on and so on and so on and so on. And, and the Red Chucks was like furious about that. He was, he was going crazy on his channel regarding that. You know, he's like, he should have, he should have knocked him out. That's what, that's, that's how he should have went down. Shut these fools up once and for all that, you know, like a DKU is some kind of like the new Bruce Lee or whatever, or, you know, like just knock him the hell out. But then Brad didn't do it. I understand why Brad didn't do it. And uh, I respect Brad a lot for that, actually, for not knocking him out because it would have been, uh, I find it would have been overkill. And then he would have been seen as a bully, you know? You ever heard of a Chu Xiao, Xiao Dong? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So the way, yeah, yeah. And so this guy, like after beating up all, all those Tai Chi masters and all that. And, then and I think I think the, the initial the match was supposed to be with him. Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But then um, people were saying that um, like it was set up in a way where like DK knew that uh, Xu Xiaodong couldn't 
it would have been impossible for him to come anyway because of visa issues and stuff like that, him being in China. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all a game yeah. set up. It's all a game set up. We're going back to warfare. So we, we are getting into the idea that this is warfare on, on a level that is behind the ring and behind the mm-hmm. cage because even, 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 uh, even him, you know, he beat off all these Tai Chi masters and Kung Fu masters. First of all, he also has a background in traditional Kung Fu and Wushu and martial arts, okay? <laughs> and, and also the people who fought to we're we're not exactly we're we're the laughing stock um, mm-hmm. of those communities to begin with. So it's it's all a show. So I, I think I think my my point here is besides any conversation we have about technique mm-hmm. and, and values of martial arts and, and and stuff like that. And now now I remember what I want to say about that before then we circle back to that. But yeah. besides that, we need to understand that the industry and this whole environment as, as its own dynamics, its own processes, okay? Just to, to, be, to, be, to be starting with and talking. So, so yes, it could have knocked him out. To gain what? People would think that these guys, DKU is a fraud and these old traditional martial arts are a fraud. They will be thinking that no matter what. It's not you winning or losing something that's gonna change their mind. People will believe that traditional martial arts have as a direct translation into a cage or they're too dangerous for the cage or something like that. We'll believe that no matter what. Mm-hmm. What you're doing, you're moving on the fringes like politics, okay? You got Democrats and Republicans. You're not going to convince Democrats to vote for Republicans or Republicans to vote for Democrats, right? In the bulk of the distribution of voters. Mm-hmm. Working on the fringes, when the fringes overlap. Okay, so what you're trying to do here is to convince people that are already skeptical one way or the other to come to your side. And, and a situation like the one that developed with the, the ending of the match is actually doing a pretty good job for both. Because there are people that are were on the fridge of considering DKU and traditional martial arts to be fraud will coming to you because they, they see the narrative of, I could have done it, I just decided out of mercy not to do it. And people that were on the fringe of thinking, well, maybe traditional martial arts have these super magic superpowers, they will believe in the DKU narrative or construction of him surviving against the five cage fighter. So it's it, it literally from if you if you take this instead of looking at just what happened in the ring, look what happened in the broader picture. This is this is the best deal. This is the negotiation they had. Uh, and, and to be honest, even in welfare, you don't want to destroy your enemy because at least you know who your enemy is. So I don't, th- I don't think that this old movement of crashing these charlatans and martial arts, traditional martial artists, is leading anywhere because there's no intention to crash them out because the pr- the, they sort of prove that you are functional as much as functional proves that you're traditional. You have something else to offer. Okay, mm. In a systemic way, we're gonna get we're gonna be stuck with these categories and as as we always been stuck with these categories mm-hmm. uh, one thing that i laugh about sometimes is the old idea that mma were these great revolutions uh historically speaking at least uh, americans like the idea of revolution it's a very conservative society but once in a while, they allow themselves those this idea of having breakthrough revolutionary people. Okay, you got Steve mm-hmm. Jobs, Elon Musk, mm-hmm. uh, and, and so Steve Jobs with his Apple and uh, the point and click and the you know the the icon system. He he could change the world. No, it was Xerox. Xerox, the photocopy machine, you know, patented that system. Okay, but you want to believe in these these figures or these social movement, the revolution, everything. Same thing with mixed martial arts. Mixed martial arts as a principle is always being there. You have mixed martial arts events in 1800 Europe, when you have boxers versus saboteur versus wrestlers. Uh, You had people coming from Japan with these strange martial arts trying to go against boxers. Uh, you have new styles emerging. Bartitsu, for example, is an example of mixed martial art. So it's always been there. But the, what changed with, with UFC was that there was a market. There was an audience for that. 
And that is what dramatically changed the space and the equilibrium between, between traditional functionals and MMA uh, martial arts. But if you look under the hood, those, those dynamics are, are what, what govern the, mm-hmm. the events. Okay, and that at least again, it's my opinion. I've been studying this for a few years, so I think this is a little bit more solid as an opinion than my opinion about boxing, as as you know, that's the sport. Okay, of boxing. okay, okay. Yes, yeah, so yeah. just just to to, um, to uh to to let the audience know, like you're you're an assistant professor at Chapman University. And yes, you, you specialize in. Uh, I think you told me political science and, and I'm a political a scientist. I'm a political okay. scientist. I mm-hmm. my what pays my bill is uh, the study of religion, religious violence, and political mm-hmm. violence. Mm-hmm. So I do a lot of studies on uh, militant conspiracy theories, or you know, neo-Nazi, or you know, even cults, mm. violence, and stuff like that. And my other hand works on uh, martial arts studies and what they call it political apology. So I do okay. study martial arts as a social phenomenon and, you know, especially from its political aspects. So a lot to deal with nationalism and uh, social, social movements. Uh, my forthcoming book will be about Kav Maga and, and Zionism and, you know, the construction of the Israeli identity uh, and the Jewish identity in the diaspora. So that's what, that's what I do. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying these things with a little more confidence that mm-hmm. w- if you ask me to comment on on the referees and the way they assign points <laughs> yeah during, yeah no i understand, I understand. okay mm-hmm. so the, the other thing that kind of circle back and then we can circle back on this if you want but uh the other thing they want to say was about that thing will get you killed because funny <laughs> enough if we're taking two stars and say well aikido will get you killed and uh say for the extreme the the, the the sake of having an extreme assumption, Nakita will get you killed, Bill JJ will save your life. Uh, if we look at the past 10, 15 years, and, uh, in, and we look at journal, newspaper news about, you know, self-defense things that went wrong, so people getting killed uh, mm-hmm. during, um, you know, because we're, we're, they were assaulted or, or, or robbed or whatever, or mugged and they would get killed. You mm-hmm. see that most of these people, especially in the last 10, 15 years, were pre-JJ practitioners. It's very mm-hmm. rare to find someone who did have a background in Aikido getting killed. And it's very easy to find someone who did have a BJJ background getting killed. Uh, there was a case a few months ago of this guy in Mexico, I think. He, he saw some kid assaulted outside of the bar. He decided to intervene. It was a BJJ professor, and he got got by by one of the gangster with a knife mm. so and I, again it's a tragic event but to my point is if you really want to be specific with the anecdote if we really want to say that the technique so x then y right the technique will get you killed then if we're really really uh orthodox in in this assumption if we're really logically strict we would need to do uh, to conclude that BJJ will get you killed. <laughs> this is going to spark so much conversation in the comment because which uh, is which is not what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Which is exactly not what I'm saying. BJJ I know, will I know, not I get you killed. Okay. Also, because you don't see the cases in which these things actually help you, because on a newspaper, you know, the tragic event goes up, not the, the event that the resulted in in people walking away with their life right mm-hmm. so you don't see those things uh, you only see the the negative you only see the event okay so there's a measurement issue here but if we stick with that measurement we stick with the assumption that we brought into that which is most youtuber do when they say that thing will get you killed we will have to logically conclude that bgj is getting you killed the muay thai is getting you killed the mma is getting you killed that all these things that we consider to be functional is what they're getting you killed. Now, what I'm saying is that the assumption we had is completely, it's a fallacy. It's completely bogus because we cannot measure it that way. Mm -hmm. So we need to separate the quality of the technique from the whole conversation that will get get you killed, et cetera. cetera. Okay. Okay. That was my two cents. And I know this clip will spark a lot of rage, uh, but please, you know, review this clip a few times <laughs> try to understand what i'm saying here i'm not that 
I don't want somebody comes in the dog and say, oh, this guy is saying the BJJ is, is fake and will get you killed. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be my clickbait. Uh, that's gonna uh, be your clickbait. That's, that's gonna, gonna be, be my clickbait uh, title. That's a great and clickbait. We, yeah, yeah, but we and we discussed this last time we, yeah. we spoke regarding clickbait, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's just to get people to it's not really a clickbait yeah, because I'm not I'm not promising something that I'm not delivering on. I'm just making uh, you know, I'm taking a little sentence out of our conversation. You know, making it attracting you, getting your attention yeah, with it. After that, you you listen to the video and then you figure it out. Clickbait is when if I were to promise you like uh, women in bikinis and then I started talking about my cell phone, you know, then that would be clickbait because that's like clickbait implies that it was dishonest. Now, if I was just misdirecting you, like I was just doing something flashy to get your attention, it's technically. I must just a I must title. disclose that that's what you promised me for this video, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> No, but you got your clickbait. You got this guy says that you should stop practicing BJJ because university you professors on the street. BJJ get your ass will get you killed on the street. Yeah, yeah. Do judo instead. <laughs> <laughs> Promote judo. It's the craziest thing. Like when I started this channel, this is a little bit off topic here, but so many people, and this is actually very inspiring to me, and it, it, it's uh, it makes me happy to hear this that um, that I've inspired people to take up judo. You know, and uh, like it, it, I'm not making any money off it and uh that's fine um and yeah so it's actually very uh you know people are actually watching my videos and getting inspired oh man you know yeah judo seems pretty interesting and yeah i'm happy about that, that so. that's amazing because in north america judo is not very popular yeah 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 it's not like huge you know in north america like uh, on the world stage like um north america is 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 not at the top the top countries who perform no. well, you know, in like uh, in the Olympics and, and, you know, like the world tournaments and all that. Oh, so. absolutely. It's, it's a very, it's a very small, it's, you know, I think us judo, if you look at their numbers, it's very small numbers compared to what judo is in France, for example, or, or yeah, Germany exactly. or Italy. France, yeah. So France is a, is a power player for judo in, 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 you know, any, any world competition and, and the U S you would imagine if you have a U.S. and, and, and it's not probably because of the popularity that BJJ has, uh, mm -hmm. which, which again, great art. And of course, um, they're, they're great quality in, in, in the U.S. So yeah, most people will go there and suppose is going to learn judo. And, you know, there, there's a lot of conversation about that, of mm -hmm. course. But, um, but I, I, think, I think it's good if you can, you know, bring more people to try it. Yeah, yeah. Because when I explain people to, to people that, um, oh, a lot of, what exists in bjj comes from judo and judo you have the stand-up part and you have the ground part and essentially it's also a lot cheaper <laughs> that's the inner joke of bjj being basically just judo yeah right? yeah yeah exactly <laughs> bjj basically just judo you know and, <laughs> and and so if you practice judo you get you, you get best of both worlds uh, and then after that you get um it's also cheaper you save a lot of money and it's more structured, right? And then, yeah, and also like there's, I find there's more, not to say that BJJ clubs don't have values or anything like that, but in judo, there's a lot of, it comes from Japan. So there's a lot of uh, tradition, there's a lot of mm -hmm. respect, you know, there's a lot of humility. There's, you know, it's, it's part of the, the, the code of, uh, the moral code of judo, right? There's, there's, there's a couple of them, I don't know them all by heart here but uh right. you know there's respect there's humility there's friendship there's uh, courage there's you know da, da, da. so and and, and it's uh, judo is an educational tool it was developed as an educational tool uh you know to um to forge uh you know kids and then eventually in you know, teenagers adults you know so to better society that was the whole thing if i'm not mistaken you know i'm sure mm -hmm. there's probably other reasons but so that's why it's such a great thing uh judo and and i enjoy it and I'm going to go, I actually decided to go deeper into judo as opposed to um, trying to get my black belt in BJJ because I'm a blue belt in BJJ, but I did it for six years. Reason I'm not purple is because I change clubs. And when you change clubs, they kind of reset you, you know, yeah. like I feel as though it's, it's, it's a loyalty thing uh, more than anything else. When it comes to BJJ, you got to stay yeah. with the same club. And until yeah. they, they, they decide that you're loyal and that you're worthy and your criteria are, are different from club to club, then that's when they give you your belt. Whereas in judo, if I, if I go to a, if I train at one club and I get to green belt, when I go to the other club, I'm still a green belt. Mm -hmm. you know, it works like that in, in, in I'm sorry. I, I mean, I'm sure it works like that too in BJJ, but 
What I'm saying is that there's a continu continuity in judo. So once I get to my black belt, like, because what people might not know in judo is that you can only get up to brown belts. You get your brown belt from your, from your sensei, but then after that, you have to pass the exam, uh, you know, at the, with the federation to get your black belt. It's no longer in your, in your club's hands to give you that black belt. So once I get my brown belt, like if I change clubs, it's not gonna, it's not gonna matter. Like uh, it's not the other clubs uh, that's gonna give me a black belt or you know, anybody for that matter. It's up to me to go get it. Of course, I have mm -hmm. to be affiliated to a club and, and so on and so on. But I mean, uh, no one's gonna stop you from, from, from getting it. That's, yeah. what, that's what I was getting at in terms of like the belt promotions. But with judo, uh, yeah, you could like in BJJ, obviously you could move around. If you're a blue belt, you move to another club, you're still blue belt. But um, what I'm saying is that it's just a little bit different. You know, like once you get in, in judo, once you have your, your, your brown belt, it's all you now. You know, you have to go. That is, that is the beauty. That is the beauty of having a hierarchical and very structured system. And which is typical to Japanese martial arts mm -hmm. in, to, you know, Aikido has their equivalent um, with the Aikikai Foundation, which is the biggest one, but there's also Tumiki, uh, there's also other organizations, they tend to have the same structure, and, and they kind of tend to have mutual recognition to a certain point, I think at least before the black belt, the black belt is a little bit different. Uh, same thing I, I, I can think with uh, uh, Kyokushin Karate, which is even more centralized, or, or Kendo, or Yaido, or Jodo, or other martial arts, arm and unarmed, within uh, within Japanese tradition. And I'm pretty sure that Chinese tradition have kind of the same setup in certain areas, certain contexts. With, with BJJ, it's interesting because so we've got these two kind of, as they say, um, uh, models, like economic models, right? You have one, which is the centralized organization, very Japanese, in which you know you have that mutual recognition is very structured. You can move from one to one, uh, and be you know having your your rank recognized. You don't have to start back, but at the same time, it kind of foster a. It, it doesn't really foster innovation as much as the decentralized model, which is typical mm -hmm. of you know North American martial arts, and uh, and particularly to BJJ. And, and so, as you were saying that decentralized and the recognition is and is not there, is not automatically assured. It depends on who you are, where you're coming from and who trained you. Uh, and, and on the one hand, it, it, is, it, is, it fosters a lot of innovation, okay? Because I'm not bounded by any organization. If I wanna throw some more wrestling into my style and I win competition, that, that makes me emerging you know, makes you win on the market. Uh, on the other hand, you got that downside that people will be really confused of what they're doing, okay? Either they're loyal or not, so they have to kind of buy into a cult mm -hmm. uh, or, <laughs> or they're, they're kind of out of the whole thing. Rokas, so we're the, talking about you. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not talking about Rokas. No, no, absolutely, no, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about like the, the whole, what I find, Again, I, and I know that I get BJJ in the comment section say, "Whoa, you kind of come in here and tell it to me to my face. You're gonna roll with me, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna Nonsense. f you up." I say, "Okay, yes, okay, I, 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 I'll put it out there. If I roll with any of you that have a BJJ background, you're gonna f me up. Okay, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's not We're the happy. conversation. Yeah, We're happy. Okay, <laughs> yes, uh, my black belt will be totally worthless, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, go with it." Um, but the thing is that we, if you look at the way BJJ expanded in, in, in North America, for example, uh, and again, this was the genius of the Graces. The Graces were as much good as martial artists that as marketeers or again, as people of, of marketing and finance and, and being entrepreneurial, They're really great on that department. The way they expanded, they boom BJJ. BJJ is booming all over the place. It's, it, it has been replacing Taekwondo Studios, oh, American wow. Karate Studios. There is a BJJ studio pretty much everywhere these days, whether it belongs to a franchise or is independent or is some this lineage or that lineage, there is a BJJ studio everywhere. 
which comes with a lot of opportunity for innovation, but also with reference to what you were saying about, this is how I have to get through the whole rank, comes with a price in terms of quality. Because let's face it, that this myth that the BJJ black belt is the hardest thing to get, uh, you know, uh, second to a date with Beyonce, uh, <laughs> is, 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 is not really true. It's true in certain contexts. It's not true in others. It wasn't true 10 years or 15 years ago, where, where because they want to expand it, they were giving away ranks. And, and that's common to every martial arts. Uh, every martial art had gone through that phase. BJJ went through that phase too, and in a certain way, they're still in that phase. Okay, I, I wasn't aware of that, that like they were giving away like black belts like a lot easier because they wanted to expand their- And, and you know, we we're talking about, and, and of course it will be someone and say, that's not true, you gotta prove that. Yeah, it's easily proved because if you look at the number of, of studios, uh, before the you know the 80s and 90s and after in the 2000s there's a boom of studios mm. so i'm not talking about the individual experience or the individual trainers or how hard is getting a black belt with the machado and getting a black belt mm. with your you know professors and and i'm mm. sure now now the criteria are getting even more strict because of course you want to put some order into that chaos but if you look at the 2000, there's a boom of... of, of oh, uh, I see. Yeah, and you can't studio. justify like you can't justify the amount of clubs that. versus like how many you know, students. Um, mm -hmm. No, and it, it can. I mean, the usual justification, which is, again, very common into martial arts, is to come up with some idea of, of you know, training in hell and, uh, you know, these dojo where people will almost get killed. And there's, you know, there's very typical in Aikido, for example, saying that there was that generation they were training so hard and so hard, but it was tough and tough. And they came out with a black belt in two years. No, they came out with a black belt in two years because the, you know, the expansion of the organization needed to have more black belts to teach more classes. Oh, and, that's and, interesting. Yeah, we're going to get... <laughs> this, this clip is going to be crazy, <laughs> I feel. A, a lot so, of the clips that, that I'm going to make out of this, uh, this whole podcast, but yeah. So again, I might be wrong, but if you look at the numbers, you see going from zero to exponential in, in, in five years or six years. And it, it doesn't have to be, I don't think people have to see this personal and say, well, you're saying my professor got their black belt in two years and it's shit, I know now and blah, blah. No, I'm not saying that, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not absolutely not saying that, but looking at the numbers, there's a lot of BJJ studios that came up. Some of those closed up too. Okay, and some are closing because of the quality of the teaching. But when you have an initial phase of expansion of any martial art, any social phenomenon, you have this big boom. Mm -hmm. It has to be that way. Otherwise, BJJ will, will still be practiced in a garage in West Hollywood. Mm. But you know, like I'm thinking too, because to open a BJJ, I've, I've, I've seen BJJ schools be opened by blue belts, purple belts. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and of course they keep working with their instructor because they're affiliated, and eventually they 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 climb up the ranks and all that. But yeah. I think that's that that's a thing too. Like you see the explosion, but not necessarily all the all those schools are 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 uh, are uh, are owned by black belts. It could be owned by like the professor. Yeah, that too. You yeah. Know? So I think I think that might be a possibility there too. You know, just to be that, fair with the uh, the BJJ no, no, community. That is a possibility. But uh, think about it this way: you have no understanding of what BJJ is. You, you watch videos on YouTube, MMA fight, and you decide you want to go BJJ, okay? You want to learn BJJ, you get good for you, okay? Great path, great community, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have two studios. One is run by a black belt. One is run by a purple belt or a blue belt. Which one are you going to go? Probably As a complete belt. beginner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh yeah, the black belt, so, 100%. Yes, 100% of the black belt. So I'm not saying that happened all the time, but at least in the initial phase of the expansion, you can sustain, okay, so you can sustain growth of dojo based on two things, rank and lineage. Mm -hmm. so to sustain it based on lineage, you have to have a clear, you know, people have to clearly understand what the lineage is. And that's why we have the UFC, because there you have the name Gracie's over everywhere. 
So you say, this dojo is affiliated with the Gracie, I'm going to that studio, okay? Because I can retrace the lineage. Mm -hmm. So one thing is lineage. Again, it takes a little bit of capital uh, from and knowledge from the person they will get in. You're not gonna get people just walk by and, and getting into your studio. And then you get, you know, the black belt, the black belt effect, the instructor effect. And what you're saying before, I have to choose between a blue belt and a black belt. I don't know anything about BJJ. I just know it's cool. I want to practice. I want to learn it. I go with a black belt because I don't know better. So that's the incentive from the organization part to have black belts. Uh, and otherwise, you can't explain why at a certain point in karate in the United States, you have this boom of 15. You got master can with all these you know, stripes on the black belt, like 15 down black belt in, 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 in karate uh, well we have 15 then in 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 Bujinkan, right uh-huh and it you know they they go up to 15 then they net dojo showed how they do it they have to be mad they have to avoid a strike on their head when they're blind you know folded and and whatever if you look at that video so it's silly it's ridiculous but then you have the inflation of ranking because you want to attract more people and, and there's no martial art that is completely immune to that, to, at, least at, yeah. at least at some point in their, in their life. In their okay, not getting yeah. in their evolution. And I'm not suggesting that we're going to have, you know, two years, 50, two years black belt given to a five years old, like in certain Taekwondo studios in the United States. We're not getting, probably gonna get there because there's a reputational mechanism and, and BJJ is invested in this idea of being hard to get. Mm -hmm. But there was a time where that wasn't that true. Yeah, but also I feel as though like um, in BJJ, <clears throat> you know, like what they say, it's hard to get. It, it might be hard to get because it's just unstru It's it, it, there's just no structure to it. <laughs> you know, because they Thank want you, you to me. be, they want you to be like an expert, uh, like an expert level, like before they give you your black belt. Whereas in judo, black belt is only the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's like you in, in judo, like my, 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 my first coach always told me that, um, well, no, when like everything that you do uh, up in, uh, during your, your, uh, your colored belts, your evolution in your colored belts, you know, your, your, your yellow belt, your orange belt, your green belt, and all the competitions mm -hmm. you do, that's just kids play. Mm -hmm. Once you finally get your black belt, now we start. Now, like you, you got the fundamentals down. Now you have your, you, you, you understand judo. You know what judo is. You have, uh, your foundation is very solid. Now we start building, you know? So a judo, and, and people are going to disagree with me here. Um, you know, some people are like, oh, it takes 10 years in my club, in, in my country, whatever, whatever. It doesn't take you 10 years to get a, like a black belt in judo. I would have gotten it in five if it wasn't for the pandemic right now. Mm -hmm. But because of the pandemic, I was working towards it. I got all my points and everything. Um, and I was working towards it. My exam was supposed to be uh, this summer, uh, uh, June uh, 2022. I was going to do my black belt exam. And I was going to get my black belt. But I would have gotten that. But now, like, we're all locked down again. So forget that for yeah. the foreseeable future. So that's on the back burner again. But I would have gotten, and the pandemic lasted, what, about 20 months? I, I would have gotten my black belt by now, like if it right. wasn't for, for this whole thing. But now I'm going to, by the time I get it, it's going to be six, seven, you know, like seven, eight, eight, seven to eight years, who knows, you know? But all that to say that um, in judo, black belt is just the beginning, mm -hmm. you know? And of course, and, and then from there, doesn't mean that you're not good. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that black belt is the beginning. You know, and after that, you have that's just like first dan. Because <laughs> yeah. when you look at the, the system, like um, a Q, a Q is a level, you know, so you mm -hmm. had like uh, you start at um, was it first, second? Uh, like, okay, I'm gonna go, go backwards, like six, yeah, it goes five, backwards. four, three, yeah, 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 exactly. Then when you get to first Q, it means you're a brown belt, and then when you get your your uh, your black belt, it's shodan, first mm -hmm. dan, that's first dan, and then you have second, and you can, you know, yeah. you, it takes time to climb that to climb that and experience and all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff. So that's where the journey begins. Whereas, um, you know, in, 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 in BJJ, it's like, of course, if you do something for 10 years, you're going to get really good at it. So there's that 10,000 hour rule that, um, that right. uh, people talk about, you know, that if you do 10,000 10, hours of anything, you're going to be uh, essentially an expert in it. 
And yeah. so BJJ, that's what they're saying. And it's, it's not, it's not, it's just that they structured it differently. And I think that they might not even have a structure to begin with. And they just kind of made it up. Ah, and I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It depends. Probably depends also the whatever organization you're talking to. But I, I agree with you. That's an important thing that it has to be said that there's a disconnection with, with the expectation that you have with the same, apparently the same belt color or belt ranking where, you know, with traditionally in Japanese martial arts, it's, just, yeah, it's, it's literally a starting point. So mm -hmm. you were just, you were in probation before, and now we're going to talk, we're going to start talking about real thing. Whereas mm -hmm. in BJJ, the sense they have of it is the point of arrival. And then of course you can always progress after that, but it's a point of arrival. So that's when you hear things like, oh, well, yeah, but BJJ blue belt will just own a judo black belt. They say, well, yeah, because they're in terms of what they, it's their sort of, competence there are about the same level yeah yeah exactly exactly you know and, and and it could be argued too that well it's going to depend on the black belt because there's levels to the that's, game like yeah absolutely that's if that's, if, if, if you have like a, a national like an international level competitor you know who started very young and now he gets his black belt at 16 you know and 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 you know now it's been a couple of years he's had his black belt you know and he's still competing you know, um, he's going to give you all like, and their school, like had a, had a, you know, like, a, uh, let's say a 40, 60 distribution, you know, like 60% mm -hmm. standing up and 40% on the ground. And he's at a high level at an international level. He'll smack he, he that, that blue belt ha has no chance. Cause that guy no, is no, just absolutely. superior athlete, you know, like, a, a, a elite level athlete, give that to a blue belt who did BJJ for, let's say two, two years, he's getting killed on the ground too. Like no, no, absolutely, absolutely. So we're talking about then you get into the 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 the, 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 the minutia, the, the minutia of yeah, the, the style, the individuals, uh, yeah. and and that's why I always find these these things, you know, BJJ versus judo, BJJ versus or versus aikido, judo versus karate. I find them interesting experiments but it's very limited because we're, we're really not accounting for a lot of variations, a lot of variables. So who are we talking about? Who are the guys that are competing? Are they uh -huh. competing at the same level within the same discipline? Yes, mm -hmm. no, they have the same level within the, the, their own discipline. Uh, it's the setup done in a way that puts both players at the same, with the, with the same opportunities. Mm -hmm. because you know there, there's videos out there that say bjj versus judo and they're showing that the bjj guy wins most of the time well to be honest with you in a judo competition you are demanded to be always trying to throw the other guy okay to be always trying to get it to always attack always 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 putting pressure mm -hmm. the bjj just wait for the other guy to give in your back drop him on the ground and that's where you start working Mm -hmm. So there's there's a there's a disconnection with context expectations as you were pointing out the individual mm -hmm. level of the athlete. So all and these the rules, things, the rules, yeah, the rules, and the rules are rules. different. Like in what match are we talking about? Are we talking a judo match or are we talking a BJJ match? Yeah, so of course that's going to make a it's going to have a huge impact on who has the advantage and who comes out on top. Yeah, so it's not even a fair uh, analysis. No, I, it can't be fair. It can't be fair to begin with because these are very specific disciplines. So we're talking about fighting as a principle, having people fight, bringing what they want to bring. That's a daughter thing. But if we bring these two specific disciplines, they have specificity. They, they, they either accommodated to find a middle ground or you're going to set up someone to lose and someone to win. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to me, they sound like, Godzilla versus Superman. It's like, okay, <laughs> who's gonna win? Or or those things, Van Damme versus uh uh versus Steven Seagal, who's gonna win? Well, well, you know, you'd have to look at like what you know, Van Damme versus Seagal. Are we talking like current Van Damme and current Seagal or Van Damme in his heyday and and Steven Seagal? Yeah, yeah, but I, I know yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Well, Seagal these days has his own orbit, it's more of a planet than a person. So <laughs> yeah, I think he can barely move, but uh even in the prime i think what would, would, would even in his prime are what are we talking about in terms of competition that's okay always it's interesting to play with these concepts but 
what I what I don't like is people getting to scientifically sound conclusions. Yeah, about yeah, you best can, you can't make that. Mm -hmm. based on this. But that's the thing too. Like to get back to you know DKU versus uh, Brad. I mean, okay, DKU is Mister Combat Warfare System, Mister Modern Day Bruce Lee. Even though he said in an interview with uh, uh, Patrick Bet David uh, that he never heard of Bruce Lee, he only heard of him recently, like or something like that. How is that even possible? Were you living under a rock? Supposedly in South Korea, <laughs> people don't know who Bruce Lee is. Somebody wrote that in the comment section. I was like, because I made a video like, hey, my beef with oh. DKU. And I was saying, this guy is full of, full of, full of crap because he's saying okay. he never heard of Bruce. And he made up all this, like his, his so-called one inch punch, whatever. He's like, oh, I made that up. Like, I didn't learn that from Bruce Lee. I learned it from some Korean general, war general. And I, I developed system myself. And I studied with a whole bunch of masters. And I got into a bunch of street fights. And I never heard of Bruce Lee. Up until wow. like, uh, like after he developed his system or much later in life. So I'm like, okay, this guy, this guy is pure uh, BSing. And then he go, and then he goes on to say that, uh, or he promotes himself as the new Bruce Lee or some people do. And I'm like, okay, let's say, so like, let's just, that was just my little rant there for a second. Now, and um, so going back to the fight with Brad, like, okay, you're Mr. Warfare Combat System. You're the modern day Bruce Lee. You're, you're the guy that, uh, you know. So why are we doing a boxing match? You should be going there <laughs> at least MMA, at least with MMA gloves. And, and you could say, okay, uh, you, could, you could rig it, you know, no grounds, no ground game, no taking, no takedowns and no submissions. You could say that, but at least, at least have like a, a, a kickboxing match with four ounce gloves like mma gloves because you're saying that you know that's what that, i know and 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 brad is mma guy you could tell him okay no takedowns no submissions like we just you know kickbox with this you know that would allow you to use all your tools all your sophisticated technology that you yourself developed to to show the world like what's up like that you can you know and it, it wouldn't matter if you get you 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 and he could have but they chose boxing out of nowhere you know so well they, me, they, no it's not out of nowhere because in in the event that you lose it's not your sport so you're not putting yeah, everything exactly, on the line exactly and it exactly. works for both of them exactly it works so for that, both of them yeah not yeah and, and and exactly and that's why like and and when you ask that question that that the only logical explanation is because yeah because obviously you don't want to get your your your, your ass handed to you you yeah. want to choose something where like you could, you could, you could play the, you could play, you could perform the way you performed, essentially hugging all the time and like just take, uh, you know, sn sniffing uh, Brad's crutch all the time and taking a dive and rolling on the ground, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and then, and then say you survived. Yeah, of course you survived because you ran away the whole time. You hugged him and then you rolled on the ground. So, and he's not allowed to kick you in the head or. He's not allowed well, to yeah, kick but your it's, mouth, so. But it's an insurance policy. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is fine. It's policy. fine. And, and, it, and, the, and the goal, the goal that you want to attain is the uh -huh. one of surviving with him. And you can, you can reframe it the way you want with your followers. It doesn't really matter. And, and he saying, stole again, that. And, and he stole that whole survival thing out of, uh, right out of the book of, right out of the page of a book of uh, Helio Gracie. When he challenged Kimura and Kimura came over and, yeah, and, you know, he said, hey, I survived for more than uh, a minute or whatever. Yep. And that means yep. I won. No, you didn't yep. win. You got smashed. But, it, but if you're, the idea was for you to survive, then yes, in that context, actually you, that you survived for the first minute, but actually he didn't survive for the first minute because when he got thrown that first time with Osoro Gary, he actually yep. passed out. Yep. Kimura didn't know that. And he yeah. just continued and woke him up while <laughs> yeah, trying to like, break his arm. <laughs> but Kimura was a beast. Yeah, of course, of course. So, like, honestly, hunch, like, you, you got to give credit to Helio for even like attempting that. Yeah. You know, even though he rigged, he tried to rig it as much as possible. He put the soft tatamis, thicker and softer tatamis, so that he wouldn't like you know, get like completely, uh, you know, like uh, discombobulated after a throw. Yeah. So and there was a lot of games and a lot, a lot of setup going on there. But just the fact that he took it against a monster like Kimura, like you got to give him props for that. And I think you could say the same for DKU. So DKU, yeah. I give him credit for that. 42-year-old going in with a ring for the first time ever in his life against like this guy that weighs 50 pounds more than you and that could literally kill you if he wanted to. And 
you know so but that's and- that's the whole point i mean you you compare yeah. with with what happened with kimura it's uh-huh. it's the same thing it's a win-win situation you win your magical being your superhero you mm-hmm. won again this beast okay a god of judo hmm? yeah you lose okay there's always a way to spin it mm-hmm. saying i survived Okay, the whole thing when after the match, when Kimura invited them, they're going to give him Kodokan ranks. And they say, mm-hmm. no, thank you. I got my thing now. Okay, and mm-hmm. I am going to name something that I do after you, which mm-hmm. and then I'm going to pretend that I invented when it's coming from Maeda directly. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and so that I own you, mm-hmm. even after I lost, ah. even after I passed out, <laughs> Even after you broke my arm, okay, also invalidating the whole thing that there are pins that you can hold for 100 years. No, uh-huh. a pin is a break in disguise. Mm-hmm. You either tap or you, you, got, you, or you go out mm-hmm. or you get broken. Uh, so I, uh, I reframe the whole thing to my own you know, benefit. And yeah. that's what he do, what, what, what Gracie did, what Helio did. Uh, and 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 it was amazing. And again, it's not a judgment on the art. The art is amazing. It's it's mm-hmm. fantastic. Uh, DKU, well, not so much. <laughs> okay, not for me. At least it's not my cup of tea. I don't think I have. Well, I always have things to learn from everybody. But he would not sign up for his classes. Let's say that way. Uh, but you know the whole Mark thing. It's the mm-hmm. whole the whole stunt. That's pretty much the same. <laughs> yeah 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 so like give him credit for that um yeah. and and like i think the title for 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 that segment where we talk for the clip where we're talking about dku and all i think it's gonna be called like uh the i don't the mer- mercy beating or something like that you know because like, yeah. <laughs> that's what i feel it was like it was it was a beating but it was a merciful beating that brad gave him because you know he um well felt sorry for him you know, didn't want to do him that way, felt he could get his point across. And of course it would benefit him like, uh, you know, in, tremendously in so many other ways. And I think that was a smart well, thing to do. And like you much- said, there's no, there, there, like in, in both cases, like, like you said, they both come out winners this way. You they know? both and come out gonna, winners. Yeah, no, and you're not going to convince anyone from knocking him out. And even if you do, you know, who are you going to be? Are you going to be the guy that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that outmarket all, all these people forever no you're not gonna be there because they're always gonna be there okay mm-hmm. you're gonna be the guy who discovered the hot water is hot mm-hmm. <laughs> you know you're beating someone that had no place in a ring to begin with mm-hmm. okay what's the achievement there and on the other side you have maybe sponsor contracts maybe other things like i'm not oh, saying he sold fight. the match but I'd say okay if i have to choose between these two things huh, okay I get some nice YouTube comments versus I got these old contracts. <laughs> Enough with the comments. I don't care. It's not a real yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. Because the comments, well, you know, they don't they don't pay the bills, right? Yeah. And uh, and exactly. what he did now, I think it's great. He proved this point. We we all see it. The ones who can't be convinced aren't going to be convinced, even if there was a knockout. There you go. And now he has different opportunities to fight different guys and set up all kinds of good stuff. And he has a friend in DKU too. You know why not? <laughs> yeah, good for him. Exactly, exactly. I mean, this is what we do. Anything else that makes sense. Nothing will be doing. In, uh, this is one other thing that I'm stealing from my C Mike. Mm-hmm. Nothing we're doing is real. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's, you, it's, you, mean, you mean on YouTube? On, on, it's on, a like, show. It's, it's a, a show. show. Uh, on YouTube for sure. And uh-huh. also in, in our practicing. It's, uh-huh. it's something we engage and we'd love to do, but it's we're we're not soldiers on a battlefield trying to learn things that will save our lives mm. yeah and if we yeah. were it will take maybe a week to be proficient in what we actually need mm-hmm. as opposed as years spent into learning new techniques and variations in martial arts and principles oh you mean proficient in like uh in, in warfare and like killing yeah. yeah because you're always you're using weapons so you learn how to shoot you learn how to like yeah. uh yeah. Use a bomb, you know, uh, s- set people up, flank them, you know, get the high ground, stuff like that. But even in the old days, even if you mm-hmm. think about the old days, the old martial arts in the old days, okay, these magical schools 
of, of martial arts that people were teaching to. And now you engage in one of those schools and you can spend years refining mm -hmm. some techniques. I mean, people back then didn't have ears to, to learn stuff that will save their life. They will have maybe a week of training, two weeks of training. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, because if, the scout, king declared, yeah. if the king declared we're going to yeah. war, we're going to war. Oh, suit up. Okay. This, yeah. this, this is a sword. This is a spear. This is a shield. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Do this, do this, do this. Go. <laughs> Even if, it, if it, even if we discount professional warriors that, you know, exist in, in certain societies, you have warrior classes, that's, that's of course, a necessity in, you know, pre-modern societies, and now we have that translated into professional armies, but even if we discount that back then, most, most war were fought by conscripts to spend 360 years, 60 days a year working their land, and maybe five days into training for the next battle, hoping to come back to their family, okay, in somehow one piece. So if I have to think about how the preparation for fight on a battlefield would go, and you know, I have two options. One is to train, three options. One is to train martial arts, you know, traditional martial arts proficiency for years. The other one is to train for years in MMA, uh, I would discard both of them because I think a more accurate description of what is going to happen is in Mulan. Mm -hmm. You travel, you get trained, Mulan, the movie, the Disney movie, okay? Okay, I haven't watched yeah. it. Huh? Yeah, you go there, you train for a week, and you're ready to fight against the hunt. You're ready? No, maybe you'll die. Yes, probably die, but that's what it is. You don't have time. To get, uh, to get prepared okay, okay. So, so that brings me to to Krav Maga because you wrote a you 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 wrote a book on this and it's coming out soon, right? Yeah, it's coming out in April two thousand twenty-two. Yeah. Okay, so here's um here's my understanding of Krav Maga. So essentially, it's a uh, um military um Israeli military uh combat hand-to-hand -hand combat system, so to speak, yeah. which they teach you. Like you said, in from my from what a friend told me is that you go in, they teach you that quick, quick, because that's what you need to know to kill people, and that's it. Yeah. It, like you don't actually spend years like uh, no. learning it and refining it, and you know it's yeah. it's like it's uh, it's it's a very um, direct and violent approach, a very uh, to you know to be able to handle yourself in war type situations. Like it's it's military, so obviously it is. I mean. In his, in his current incarnation, and then, you know, the, the whole Krav Maga has also evolved into a self-defense system and a martial art. And, you mm. know, you have this mythological founder, Himrik, Him, um, Lichenfeld, Himi, that created it with his own experience. And so we can go around and um, there's a lot of history about that. Uh, but the way it's taught in the IDF, which is the Israeli Defense Force, is always being taught in the IDF and the Israeli Defense Force is a crash course for recruits, and let's keep in mind that they do have a draft, they do have a compulsory military service, which lasts, you know, maybe a few days and is refreshed a few hours, uh, you know, during yeah, the old service. The uh -huh. Then the, the scope of that is to, first of all, to transition you from a civilian mentality to a military mentality. So you're exposed to risk and you have to react. So you have to kind of boost that aggressiveness, which also we were talking about before the aggressiveness in civilian life. It shouldn't be modeled after that because the scope and the limitation of what you can afford in civilian life is completely different than even the goals. But what is done is there, you know, immediate that sort of reaction and also giving you technique literally to most of the techniques will boil down into fight, break distance, get your side weapon and finish what you have to do. Because you're supposed that the assumption is that you're going to be armed. The assumption is that you're going to be armed and you're going to be in a team of other people. Okay, so it's not going to be just you defending unarmed from somebody trying to attack you to steal your purse. It's going to be a completely different situation, a completely different scenario. So that, that is what is Krav Maga, which mean, literally means empty-handed combat, a hand-to-hand -hand combat within the context of the military where it's taught in Israel. Now, what mm. we see in civilian, it's a transition that was initially made by Imi when he ended his service as an instructor within the IDF 
to create his own business, to create his own thing. That was thing that he was good at doing it. Why not making money out of it? Why not teaching out of it to other people? But in order to do that, there has to be made, there are a lot of changes that have to be made. It had to be turned into a martial art. It had to be turned into a curriculum that was extensive enough to be taught over several years. So I'm not just getting your money for a week. And it has to address different scenarios than the military because we're not talking about people in full gear carrying side weapons in a team of other four or five people but we're talking about people wearing civilian clothes unarmed in a street of tel aviv or netanya or whatever other city so there's there's a big transition there that has made but again the point that you were making the military is always different so mm -hmm. we can't look at the military as a template for what we need to do in civilian life because it's it's different. It's the, the nature of life. It's and the nature of the encounters are completely different. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's very insightful. Like I, you know, uh, I really like the, the the way you explained that. It makes sense now. So essentially, the um, the 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 instructor. No, not mm -hmm. the instructor, sorry, the founder of, of Krav Maga. He was a, a Krav Maga instructor in the military. Yeah. And then from there, like when he when he stopped the military, like when he got out, then he, well, he said, oh, I'd like to teach this, you know, to, mm -hmm. uh, to civilians and make a business out of it. So then yeah. he had to switch it up. He had to like build a curriculum where, okay, we're going to learn step one, step two. It's going to take this many years. Uh, okay, we're going to have different scenarios because now we're in, uh, we, yeah. we're going to, we're going to, we're going to like spin it. Uh, we're going to adapt it for self-defense, you know? Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden it's not the same thing anymore. It's not no. what, uh, but was he the founder or was he just an instructor? Like the, the gentleman that so, you spoke well, of? If we're talking about Imi as the founder of Imi. Krav Maga in, in, in what we know as Krav Maga in the gyms that you can go and practice. Oh, yes, he is the founder of that because that is the system that came out of his own experience out of the military. But if you look at how the system developed in the military, it, it's certainly in depth to what he'd done. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were also other people. And it was, you know, the, the, the core of that was there, you know, developed by others also along with him and before him. Uh, mm -hmm. We're talking about the, the British mandate in Palestine. So the, the, this, this person, Imi, is, is, is a European Jew that he, uh, that he experienced anti-Semitism, that he experienced the Nazi regime, he experienced you know, the, the hunt for Jews in Europe. He organized a neighborhood sort of militia to defend the Jewish community from the incursion of, of uh, the, 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 the zone government, which was allied with, uh, with the German. And, and then, you know, during World War II, it was, a, you know, his father was a policeman. He was taught about a little bit of self-defense and law enforcement. He was a wrestler. He was a boxer. He did judo, too, at some point. So he, he comes to Palestine. It, it, he moved to Palestine during the time of World War II to escape the situation in Europe. And he started sort of like working with the Haganah, which were the paramilitary organization that defended the Jewish settlement. In, in the area that then turned into be the bedrock of the IDF. So when that change happened, it transitioned into the IDF as a physical activity and self-defense instructor for the new recruit. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of what he did and he developed into the Krav Maga, but he didn't invent the Krav Maga system within the military. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, you know, I uh, Moshe Feldenkrais was also involved into, into this process, right? Mm -hmm. With his idea of having a natural response. And so Feldenkrais has this, this intuition that uh, human beings are already geared to defend themselves. They have this flinch reaction, the stimuli. And so he studied that at a time where the, the Jewish settlers wanted to defend themselves. And apparently traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu or stick fighting or other things were not as proficient. Mm -hmm. So he was tasked uh, to find an adaptation for that, to find something that they could be, you know, used to train quickly people and being effective on uh, mostly were like, you know, kind of a mob violence when you have a group of people clashing with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that he couldn't have weapons on them so that was also a, a, a tap, like a step into the development of the art. 
uh, and Hemi was involved in that at some point. He instructed that. But Krav Maga, as we know, so the Krav Maga that we know in the military is not his invention. Gotcha. What is gotcha. what he can be credited very for? Credited for exactly is to have created the martial art of Krav Maga. Okay, I see. Not the not the system, yeah. not the military uh, system of Krav Maga yeah. in the military, but the martial art. Essentially commercialized. Like, yeah, well, it, it essentially, yeah, essentially sense. created as a martial art. Like you look at yeah, Kano, for example. Did Kano did the same thing in a certain way? He didn't invent the jujitsu. He took some things from jujitsu and he created his exactly, own system. Exactly, exactly. But there were also other people involved into that creation process. So that's why, why you have this continued tension between Kano and Kodokan in Tokyo and, and, and the Kosen Judo in Hosaka. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind Shady of talks the Shadi yeah. talked about, talks about that a lot. And I remember having discussions there. With, exactly. Uh, and you have this continuous tension. Okay, you have the Guardian of the Kodokan also. They're involved in the way they developed there and the way they mm -hmm. developed. Why you have uh, you have a lot of you know, Newaza in Kodokan in, in, in Kosen, but you don't have a lot of Newaza in, in, um, in Kodokan. That was a choice. Okay, mm -hmm. so Judo, Kodokan, Judo developed in a certain way. Kosen, Judo developed in another way. Still Judo. Mm -hmm. We still recognize Kano being the founder of judo, but it wasn't just his own work. Mm -hmm. Okay, he constructed judo based on something with the help of someone else. Same thing for for Kav Maga. Yeah, At least yeah. Based on my research, and again, I can be wrong, but based on my research, that's what I found. Okay, okay. You know, you'd you'd have a great uh, you'd have a great conversation uh, with with Shadi. At one point, if if ever you guys get together, because he he does he's he's all about like researching the history of oh know, no no I know his podcast judo this, this yeah YouTube yeah like, is yeah. amazing yeah 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 well maybe when he sees this then he'll be uh, he'll be interested in you know like uh, talking to you more and you know because you're well you know when two when two people have extensive knowledge in like the same area you know more or less yeah. It makes for it makes for great uh, conversation. Oh, he certainly knows a lot about judo that I that I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to have that conversation, also for you know for a learning point point of view. I always follow. It's one of the channels that I follow. So yeah, yeah, I enjoy his. I really yeah. enjoy his channel, and he's he's a great guy. Honestly, like yeah. I did a podcast with him, and um, yeah, I'll have to do one. Uh, do another one with uh, with him eventually. Hey, so your book yeah. to get back to your book, like that's. Yeah. What is your book about? Obviously, it's about Krav Maga, but I, yeah. uh, I read the title and um, let me see here. Uh, give me one second. It's called hmm. For Zion's Sake. That's the, the, the subtitle, and it's uh, Krav Maga and the Birth of Modern Israel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Krav Maga and the Making of Modern Israel. The Making, Israel. yes, the Making of Modern let's, let's Israel. Yeah, I can't even remember my own book title. That's probably, yeah, we've been yeah, talking no, for three I, hours, so it's kind of, but uh, <laughs> no. But, but, so for, it, for Zion, who's Zion? Who's no, Zion? that's a quote. Like, that's a quote from the Bible. Zion is, you know, Zion is okay, Jerusalem, okay. right? Okay, so, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So the 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 idea that I was exploring, I'm, you know, a political scientist, so I'm interested in nationalism. Uh, I'm interested in how identity develops, especially religious identity. And I'm interested in martial arts and I wanted to do something that didn't have a specifically to do with Japanese martial arts because I've done work on that. Mm -hmm. So I found this, the, the, the topic of Krav Maga really understudied. There's only a few people out there that actually study Krav Maga from you know, a scholarly perspective within mm -hmm. apology or, or, or martial arts studies. And I said, so why not? So I'm not a Krav Maga practitioner. Okay. I did train a little bit with them just to understand, talk to people, of course, but I'm not a Krav Maga practitioner. Uh, so of course, anything that I say in the book that has to do with the technique of Krav Maga or something, which is very, very small things is either my mistakes or somebody else's merit. Um, so what I was interested in was pretty practically looking at how Krav Maga as an example of martial arts, influences the uh, creation of a national identity. So what was the role of Krav Maga in the construction of the state of Israel, in the construction of the Israeli identity? And also 
of course, how Krav Maga is impacted by that. Uh, and, you know, and I extended a little bit to, to the Jewish diaspora and see what makes Krav Maga appealable to Jews that are not living in Israel, Jews in the United States, Europe, Canada, or, or other countries. So that is the plan of the book. Uh, and so I'm talking in the book, I'm talking about the history of Krav Maga, I'm talking about training experiences, mine and others, the meaning of Krav Maga for people, either Jews or not. I'm talking about Zionism, which is a bad word these days, but I'm not touching the political tension that is around Zionism as a, whatever you want to call it, a colonial enterprise or, you know, something more close to a self-determination process. Okay, so uh, the, um, the, 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 the idea that I have is that how Zionism impacted the development of Krav Maga in a, in a time where Jews were sort of transitioning from an identity builds around weakness, you know, maybe, you know, mental strength and brain strength and education, but you know, there's a reason why, of course, but physically weak to physically proud, phys being physically proud, physically proudness, so being physically strong and assertive. Mm -hmm. And so I, I investigated that. Okay. In yeah. No, it sounds interesting. Like, I'll, I'll definitely read it when, uh, when it comes out. It's coming out on, you said April 22nd, right? April 22. Yes. Yes. April 22. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So, well, when it comes out, it's going to be available like uh, on um, in bookstores, on Amazon. It's on... going to be available probably on Amazon and bookstores. It's published by Roman and Littlefield, which is a mm -hmm. uh, UK based, but also they have a, a company here in the US too, a UK based publisher. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. I'll get a copy for sure. And uh, I'll, I'll read it, you know? And we'll, we'll okay. have another podcast and we'll talk about more. Uh, well, right. We'll talk about more about, stuff. More about that. All right. Hey, okay. So, so, so for Krav Maga, like we're running on like three, almost three hours now. So yeah. I got to leave soon, but uh, me too. Before me I too. Leave, actually, I'm okay. actually overdue. I think I, was overdue? Like, I, uh, I have a uh, phone call now. I don't know if the beauty of the having this done. You have a phone call. One second. Uh, Okay. We are a few more minutes. Don't worry. Okay. Right. Okay. A few more minutes. So like, just to wrap it up, like, um, Krav Maga. Okay. Yeah. What do you think of it as it is now? Like, is it something worth learning? Is it because, you know, now it's, it's sold as a martial arts for self-defense. Yeah. But you know, we, we spoke a little bit, we touched on this already. Uh, but, um, yeah. What are, what are your thoughts on it? Do you think it's, it's something worth exploring or it's, it's more negative than anything else because, you know, it puts you in a mindset of kill mode all the time. Uh, I, I you, think it's, it's and, worth and training in it. So, yeah, yeah sorry, I think sorry. it's, and I, I, I trained with, uh, luckily enough, I trained with very good people and uh, also very good environment, um, which, which in a way deprived me from the experience of being immersed in a bad environment. But uh, mm -hmm. I don't think I, were, I was ready for that, or at least that there were no places like that around me. I tried to connect with one of the bad places that McDojo Life kind of sort of like pointed out the life round gun, but it didn't work. Uh, but so I was lucky enough. And I say, um, if, you're, if you're looking for Krav Maga for various reasons, because you're fascinated by the Israeli um, roots or because you think it's an effective way of self-defense, by all means, go it, uh, go for it. Uh, accounting that you find yourself into, into a community that is not the one that actually just fostered that aggressiveness and that uh, uh, sort of trying to create the two, a place that is giving you PTSD as opposed to giving you good <laughs> teaching. So avoid those places like, like, like fire, okay? Don't, don't be there. But if you find a good place, I think it's worth exploring if, you, if you're interested. And that's, that's beside the technical, again, I'm not a practitioner of Krav Maga, so I can't really judge the quality of their, of their technique. I found myself most of the time when I was practicing really out of my place because, for example, one of the idea is, you know, you get attacked, you get uh, bear hugged or, or, you know, choked or whatever. So you have to escape, punch, 
and go away. That's that's pretty much the experience at my level that, that was what, what was required. Mm -hmm. And I find myself most of the time just engaging rattling. And it was like, no, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> so what <laughs> I just, broke, I, I can't get to the back. I can grab the belt and just do whatever. No, that's not what we're doing. So, you know, for that, for that, I think it was great for me because it was a way for me to see sometimes maybe the same technical principle, but in a very different context. Mm -hmm. And so forces me to think about my reactions in, 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 my, in my specific case. If you're someone who wants to learn it, again, ask yourself why you want to do it. Uh, ask yourself what you're going to get in, in, in exchange of your practice. And as in any other martial arts, of course, my, my advice is to shop, talk to people and see what they're doing. What's their style? Mm -hmm. If you walk into a place and see just posters with, with people dragging a dark alley and all these signs that says the violence is everywhere. You got to be prepared and you're going to get killed. You're going to get mugged and blah, blah, blah. Just go somewhere else. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice, you know, and uh, I yeah, definitely be, be, be open to learning Krav Maga at this point in, uh, in, my, in my martial arts journey, yeah. my martial arts evolution. <laughs> I stole that from Rokas. But um, yeah, but definitely like finding the right uh, environment, finding the right teachers, that's what's important. Obviously, I'm not worried about being attacked. I mean, I live in a very safe area, uh, you know, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. We, we don't have any guns here. <laughs> you know? As the majority of us were speculating on these things on YouTube, because again, we were talking about that before, right? I find it's very amusing that mm -hmm. uh, people, people that are actually risking their life are not wasting their time commenting on somebody else's YouTube video. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You're, you're busy trying to survive and you're trying yes. to like organize your, your life so that you can, you know, uh, yeah. well, you know, survive, right? Hey, so yeah. I'm going to let you go. I think we should end yeah. it here for now. Yeah. And, uh, okay. It, it, it was, it was it great. Was great. It was great. Like I didn't even see the time fly. And the only reason yeah, yeah. I got to leave now it's because well, fatigue at one point sets in hunger. Yeah. And also like, we all also have other stuff to do. And, uh, but thank you very much for, you know, uh, thank being you. on the show, this conversation. It was amazing. I think that it's going to make for like a lot of very, uh, fun and interesting, uh, clips, you know? Where we're yeah, gonna buy the, gotta, the clickbait, buy the clickbait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll make, I'll make it really. I'll, titles will be good, clickbaity, and all that. And then we're gonna have some good discussions on, uh, on what do you call it? Uh, like in the comment section for sure. The comment section. Yeah. Never <laughs> read. Never read the comment section. <laughs> oh, the thing is, if if you if you take things personally, you might want to stay out of it. Um, like I, yeah. I'm there, but I mean, at this point, I learned to. Uh, I'm good with, uh, you know, all, all types of. Yeah, I, I'm okay. I'm okay with. Um, you know, people, people trolling and all that, because the way I look at it is that if somebody trolls you, it's because, um, they want attention. And yeah. if you give them the attention, it means you're, 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 you, you're buying into the game. Like you're giving them what they want, you know? So why give them what they want? And it doesn't solve anything. Like if somebody no. has a, writes a comment and it's, they disagree with you, but they, they explain it properly and they want to have a conversation. Yes, we can have a conversation, not a problem. I'll make a video about it or I'll answer. But if somebody is just trolling, this person is just looking for attention and yeah. I'm not going to give it to them because then oh, they no. win. So, and yeah, whatever absolutely. they say, I'm like, whatever. No, it's, you not, know? It's, no, no, and it's not. It's not say what work. you want to say. It doesn't matter, yeah. you know? So that's that. But um, yeah, no, thanks again. And uh, thank you, man. For everybody listening, uh, April 20, uh, 2022 for the book and uh, uh yeah i'll put i'll put the links and everything well appreciate it. i'm gonna have i'm gonna have clips out like before that so okay okay perfect mm. appreciate but anyways we'll uh we'll talk we'll more about that, that. Okay, okay so i'm gonna end it here thank you thank you bye